Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for 2023. Today we have apologies from Ash Regan, and I welcome Colette Stevenson joining us as a substitute member. The first item on the agenda is taking uh, business in private, and that is whether we have to consider whether to take items six and seven in private. Item six is the consideration of evidence we will hear today as a part of our inquiry into Scotland's ele electricity infrastructure inhibitor or enabler of our energy ambitions. And item seven is consideration of evidence we will hear today in relation to Scotland's deposit return scheme. Are we agreed to take those items in private? Agreed. We are agreed. So our next item, uh, agenda item two, is to uh, is consideration of a consent notification on the REACH Amendment Regulations 2023. This is a UK statutory instrument where the UK Government is seeking the Scottish Government's consent to legislate in areas of devolved competence. The Committee's role is to decide whether it agrees with the Scottish Government's proposal to consent to the UK Government making these regulations within devolved competence and in the, in the manner that the UK Government has indicated to the Scottish Government. At our last meeting, we considered the notification and agreed to request further information about the proposed extension to the registration dates and its impact in Scotland from the regula relevant regulatory bodies and the UK Government. Um, there has been additional letters received, which I believe all the committee now have. We also agreed to invite the Minister for the Environment and Land Reform to give evidence today. We have until the 31st of March to respond to the Scottish Government's notification. So straight after today's evidence session, we aim to come to a view today. Um, and I'm pleased, therefore, to welcome Mari McCallan, the Minister for the Environment and Land Reform. Thank you, Minister, for attending at short notice. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Dan Merkel, the Chemicals Team Leader, and Elisa Hine, lawyer from the Scottish Government. Now, we've got about 20 to 25 minutes for this item. Um, before we move into questions, Minister, I believe you would like to make a very brief opening statement. Yes, Minister. will do, Convener. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me here today to discuss the proposed statutory instrument to extend registration deadlines under the transitional arrangements of UK REACH regulation. Uh, the purpose of the statutory instrument is to extend by three years uh, the dates by which manufacturers or suppliers of chemicals in Great Britain, or as I'll uh, refer to it here and after GB, uh, must register their substances in UK REACH. Um, now, following uh, feedback, work is currently ongoing, looking at how registration arrangements may be improved in UK REACH. Uh, the extension is proposed to allow this work to be completed and to give business certainty on their obligations in the meantime. Now, by way of very brief background, the UK REACH regulation replaced the equivalent EU REACH um, regulation following EU exit. UK REACH applies in GB and regulates the marketing and use of the majority of chemicals on the GB market. Um, now, the uh, Brexit that was eventually negotiated, a hard Brexit, it meant we were denied membership of the European Chemicals Agency, um, and as such, we've had to set up an entirely autonomous regime that essentially mirrors that of the EU. Um, now, registration under UK REACH is a significant undertaking for businesses in GB, uh, likewise for the Health and Safety Executive, which delivers most of the technical functions of the UK REACH, and DEFRA as the UK REACH policy lead. These proposed extensions to the registration deadlines arise from the significant financial and practical challenges that registration poses for GB businesses. Um, now, just to put that into context, compliance with EU REACH was estimated to have cost UK businesses some £500 million. The current uh, DEFRA estimate of cost to UK business under the new regime is between £1.3 and £3.5 uh, billion. Pounds. As well as cost to business, in Scotland we have a large number of SMEs who uh, are unlikely to have directly interacted with the, with the EU reach and will have relied on others in the supply chain to do uh, the necessary on their behalf. So an extension is actually particularly important for, for Scottish business, their supply chains and ultimately consumers 
in Scotland. Um, concerns have been raised and potential improvements have been considered. And while that work is underway, the three year extension is thought to be um, appropriate. Now, the committee will recognise that some of you know, the concerns that I've set out there are largely about business, they're largely about costs, but you will recognise that in my role as Minister for Environment, I need to be content about the impact uh, of any changes on the environment. Um, now, while the proposed extensions are far from ideal, I am satisfied that there are sufficient mitigations in place, such that the, uh, the potential for negative consequences for the environment is low. And just by way of practical example of that, during this extended transitional phase, suppliers and users of chemicals in Great Britain will continue to follow the safeguards that are in place under the EU reach, uh, as all chemicals subject to the proposed extended deadline were, are, are already registered under uh, that regime. And perhaps we can get into a little bit more of that in questioning. But in summary, I consider this situation to be far from ideal. Um, but as is the case for most things with EU exit, frankly, but uh, I do believe that the risks to Scottish business, consumers and the operation of the regime itself by not agreeing to this proposal is greater than the risk to the environment from consenting to it. i um, happy to take questions and I'll certainly bring in my colleagues too because there's some quite technical aspects of this. Thank you very much, Minister. The first question is going to come from the Deputy Convener, Fiona Hislop. Fiona. Uh, thank you and good morning, Minister. Um, the issue of chemical registration was one of the key areas of concern when the UK left the, the EU. Um, so in terms of the SSI in, in front of us, how has the Scottish Government assessed the implications of the proposed extensions to registration and compliance uh, checking deadlines for areas that are within devolved competence? What have you done? Um, so it's a very good question. Um, the, the area of chemicals is quite a complex split of devolved and reserved issues, um, for example, uh, the environment itself being devolved, but health and safety being reserved. So we've very much worked um, with DEFRA and with the health and safety executive, who are the competent authority um, for uh, these matters at UK level. Some of the points that I have reassured myself on about the impact on devolved matters are those which I was uh, beginning to allude to in my opening remarks there. Firstly, that we're only talking about um, chemicals the only chemicals affected by the transitional arrangements are those which are already under the EU REACH regime. So I'm comfortable that the rules there will continue to apply to them. Any new chemical, any novel use will have to, be, uh, will have to register um, straight away and will not be caught by any extension that we are proposing here. And I think also it's about recognising that there is risk to not acting. Um, because if we have a, a, registration, um, a, a registration process which business and industry is telling us they cannot comply with in the time that they are going to have to, well, the risks of not acting and having a, a system which is unworkable is more problematic uh, both to business and to the environment, I would suggest, uh, than, than not acting. Um, so all of that has been considered. Officials have worked very closely with DEFRA and with Health and Safety Executive, who are the competent authority in all of that. So, so you've addressed the point that there are risks to actually delaying um, the, the approval, but in, in making that assessment um, and in the overall um, extension, we understand that from SEPA that they hadn't been sought advice from uh, by the, the Scottish Government. So how did you make your assessment on this? Um, so just to address the point on SEPA, they are obviously the regulator for environmental issues in Scotland and they will be for the environmental impact of REACH overall. But the competent authority for the issue of registration is the Health and Safety Executive. And that's a, I think that was a decision that was made across the board with Scottish ministers, Welsh ministers, etc. So they are the equivalent of SEPA in this, and therefore we've been working closely with them on it. But um, officials are keeping SEPA very closely updated with all of these uh, developments, and they are always welcome to... You know, give us their feedback on that. I don't know whether, Dan, you might want to say more about the engagement you've had with SEPA, but certainly they are not the official body for this. <coughs> oh, and I think the convener say we need to be as short as possible. I'm, I'm happy for you to come in, Dan, but I, I, I think the Minister's made it clear. Are, are you happy with that? Yes, yes I am. And my final question is about the common frameworks. Now, they're going to be key for whole aspects of 
um, the ongoing EU exit. So how has the common framework on chemicals and pesticide uh, and its associated governance structures been used to support the agreements between the UK and devolved governments on these proposals? And do you think the common framework is functioning as anticipated? And is this an example of that or, or otherwise? I think this is an example of that. I think us getting to this point and the, the um, I suppose the cross UK agreement that we've reached to get here is a result and is an example of the common frameworks on chemicals and pesticides functioning. Thank you. Um, Mark, you've got some questions. Yes, thank you. Good to see you, Minister, from the committee this morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the concerns that environmental stakeholders have and about how that you've, you've addressed those in discussions within the common framework and coming to the decisions that you have collectively. So one of those concerns is around divergence within this delay period. So I understand that at the moment the EU is considering the phase out and has taken the first steps towards phasing out 47 groups of chemicals mm -hmm. under their regime, but the UK is only considering three under the UK REACH scheme in terms of that first phase of considering the environmental and health impacts of chemicals and how quickly they can be phased out. So I'm wondering, do you, do you see the potential here for divergence given the deadlines and the lack of pace which yeah. the UK scheme sure. puts in place? So I think I, I would split that the answer very briefly into two points. Firstly, with what we are dealing with today, which is just squarely about the extension of the deadline rather than what system might re replace uh, the, the uh, registration arrangements. When it comes squarely to the point about the decision for today and, and the extension to the deadline, I don't really see I don't have much of a concern as regards divergence because I think we're talking here about trying to have a complete register and getting there uh, in a timescale that's realistic. And I don't see much scope for very concerning divergence between us and the EU in that regard. In fact, their register, I think, took 10 years to complete. And if we make, if we agree to this today, I think the, what we'll be dealing with in UK reach will be about a similar timescale. I think the risk of divergence comes further down the line when we're looking at, well, what system is going to, what changes are going to be made to the system that this time extension is needed to, to look at. And uh, officials are very much involved in the working groups looking at what might be changed to um, registration. And I think, you know, we've been quite clear from the outset that we would not tolerate any diminution in, in standards. Um, and that's, the, that's our starting point for the work with DEFRA that's just very much in the early stages that I pointed out to you though is a, is a live one so 47 groups of chemicals that are going through the first phase of being you know the process to be being phased out within the EU and only three groups of chemicals within the UK system so how do you how does the kind of alternative model of UK reach ensure that we don't have that divergence going forward because that feels to me like a very live case of of divergence that's already creeping into the system so how will, how will the model ensure that, as we understand more about chemicals and their health environmental impacts, decisions can be made quicker to get them on the path towards being phased out? Yeah. Um, well, I might, I might come to Dan if he's got anything else uh, to offer on the specific point that you raised. But I think for my part and for today, I'm content that extending the deadline doesn't increase the risk of diversions. And as we go in to develop changes to the registration system, my officials and I are very clear that we won't, we won't um, tolerate any diminution in standards and I'll be very watchful for any risk of divergence there and we would want to see that mitigated as far as possible. But Dan, I don't know if you know more about the specific that Mr Ruskell is, is talking about there. Um, yeah, I'm happy to come in Thank if, you. if that helps. Yep. So, so I think you're referring to restrictions under REACH, which is a, yeah. obviously a separate process from registration, although registration data will be used in the restrictions process to inform those dossiers. So um, under UK REACH, we have two projects ongoing. One is this alternative transitional registration model, which is looking about fixing the problems we're talking about here today. The other big project is called REACH Improvements, and that's about trying to change wider aspects of REACH to make them better. And Scottish, uh, Scottish Government and Welsh Government are particularly fo focused on restrictions under that project. And we want to see better use made of decisions and work done in other countries 
and other regulatory regimes so that they can be fast-tracked into UK reach and hopefully save resource that can be put into specific issues around um, chemicals on the GB market. Um, and with the alternative registration model, the idea is that the information requirements on, in, on intrinsic properties of chemicals shouldn't change much, but we want to see an increased um, emphasis on use and exposure in the GB context, which should really help identify where there are risks that need to be controlled through, for example, restriction. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I've um, got another couple of questions on, on this. I mean, no, I'm going to, have to ask you to be brief on the basis of other committee members. Okay, well, I'll roll them up together then. I mean, the, there was a decision made to not go for the, the preferred option that was put forward um, by the UK government, which was a, a delay of three years, two years, and one year for different categories, and instead, Another option was taken to go for three years, three years, three years for all those three categories. What was, what was the Scottish Government input into that de decision? Um, well, we worked with DEFRA in advance of the public uh, consultation that they then put out and which then was, I think it was answered by industry, trade associations, NGOs, you know, a broad spectrum, although admittedly it was very, it was uh, the majority of the respondents were trade and industry uh, representatives. That was very clear that the three years extension across the board was the, the workable option in their view, as opposed to, I think, what the UK government's preferred option was, which was to um, extend the first by three, the second by two, and, and the latter by one. Um, and I, I think that on the backdrop of that assurance, that these extensions in the view of DEFRA and the view of the Health and Safety Executive are not uh, likely to be detrimental to the environment. I was happy that three years across the board was appropriate if that's what trade and industry uh, believe is necessary to make this right. Because again, it goes back to the point I raised with um, Fiona Hislop, that the risk of not getting this right is substantial. Um, and if we need that time, then we need the time. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question has come from uh, Jackie. Jackie Dunbar. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. Um, can I ask, is there a realistic alternative open to the Scottish Government uh, from consenting to the extension deadline for registration and compliance? And what would happen if Scottish Ministers refused consent? Um, I, I don't think ultimately that there is a realistic Alternative. I think that, you know, we spoke about the common frameworks. These are the, the, the ways that we've agreed to try and work together in the post-Brexit landscape. Um, and I think that so far that has worked well. One of the problems that I, you know, personally I think we have with UK REACH is that we're no longer doing it on an international basis, like what we did with EU REACH, to suggest that we could do anything, you know, even more insular within Scotland. I don't think would be credible. So it's, I think it's better for everyone involved that we continue to work together, continue to take advice from the health and safety executive, um, continue to consult. And um, you know, as for the, the bit of work that's ongoing just now on what might be changed with the uh, registration process, I'm, uh, I, I'm comfortable with the fact that Scottish Minister's consent will likely be required to any of those changes and that uh, a statement in compliance with Article 1 of REACH UK will be required, which will demonstrate how it doesn't represent a uh, difficulty for the environment. Okay. Do you want me to ask my other question now? Or we... Yep, by all means, go for it. Um, it's just to ask if you anticipate if there's going to be any other forthcoming amendments required uh, for the REACH regulation. Um, I wouldn't anticipate any further changes as to the timescales. I wouldn't anticipate a further extension, although I suppose it's not impossible, but a lot of uh, resources currently being arranged in DEFRA, I understand, to make sure that it's done in the appropriate time. But I expect we will be back at some point discussing uh, substantive changes to the registration process, because, of course, it's examining that that the extension is required for. OK, thanks, Jackie. Uh, Colette, I think you've got some questions. Yeah, um, good morning, Minister, and um, this question's a fairly long one, so bear with me. So the, the, we're obviously aware of other significant developments in the, this area, including the 2020 EU chemical strategy and the forthcoming UK chemical strategy as well. 
So how is the Scottish Government and the agencies engaging with these developments and what resource is committed to this? And will the forthcoming UK chemical strategy apply in Scotland in the devolved areas? Um, and obviously, is the Scottish Government as well feeding uh, into that strategy as well? Um, I'll try and answer that. And if I need to hand over to my officials, I perhaps will, because I know they'll be uh, involved with that just now. Um, basically, I think the, the UK strategy is currently being developed. Um, I understand our team's are feeding into that and that our position at this point is that we are um, currently withholding our approval of it whilst we make sure that the final version um, reflects the input that we've made and it, it, uh, you know, is in line with Scotland's interests and I think that that's a similar position that Welsh ministers are currently making. Um, Dan or, or, or Ilsa may have more to add to that but just briefly on the EU strategy I think uh, we are keeping a watchful eye on it and actually I suspect that a lot of what we are, will be feeding into the UK strategy development will be uh, part of learning from the EU strategy as well, of course, in line with our desire to retain uh, pace with the EU. I don't know if there's anything to add to that. Um, I think so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. The other thing I wanted to um, ask you about was um, in terms of the consultation that's been, uh, been rolled out and the 20% compliance checks per tonnage coming in. Are you comfortable with that level? Yes, I'm, I'm comfortable with 20%. I think that's the... Um, I don't really... I don't think that's something that has been up for discussion as part of this development. I'm comfortable if, if the Health and Safety Executive believe that 20% is sufficient for them to get uh, the right kind of... Um, return that they need, then yes. I think the point for the extension is that that will have to come after completion of the final registration deadline. Yes. Is that right, Dan? Yes. Just in terms of the impact assessment being carried out, from, I know it's from more so from the UK government aspect, but are you relatively comfortable in terms of the costs and the risks there with that and the extension? Yes, yes, I am actually, and I am in um, agreement with um, Rebecca Pau, who I know uh, wrote back to the committee, um, and thank you for sharing those documents with me. And I think, just as she put it, uh, we believe that allowing the extra time could lessen potential burdens on businesses without significantly impacting on human health and environmental protections. We also recognise the potential for better quality data and maximising chances of compliance under the longer time scales. Um, I'm in agreement with her on that. Okay. Thanks, Minister. Thanks. Um, and just to remind uh, people who, who, who are not at this meeting, that letter came in quite late last night, so it will be published uh, on, on the website so people can see it. Um, Monica, I think the next question is yours. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, Minister, you said earlier on in your remarks that this involves a complex split of devolved and reserved issues. So I wanted to ask if you can <coughs> outline how the government, the Scottish Government, will ensure that devolved interests are represented in the development of the proposed alternative registration process for UK REACH. Yes, of course. Um, so we are, through the Common Framework process, we um, liaise very closely um, and we will continue to do that. Um, our, my officials are part of the working group, which is currently looking at um, development of the uh, registration system and how it might change. Um, and as I say, I've, we've been given assurances about DEFRA, um, making sure there's sufficient capacity, etc., to, to get that work done in, in, in the time period. When it comes to uh, approving whatever the final outcome is, um, because of the um, statute under which the process is undertaken, Scottish Minister's consent, I understand, will be required and therefore the, the parliamentary scrutiny will be engaged there. Um, and also, as I think I said, um, I think it was in response to Colette Stevenson, the, it will have to be accompanied by that statement in line with uh, UK REACH Article 1, which uh, sets out the confidence that it's not... Um, that it's in line with environmental protections and doesn't threaten any of that. 
Thank you for walking us through that. Um, I know divergence has been mentioned a few times today and some of the, some of the risks. Um, do you have concerns that this um, registration process will represent a significant divergence from EU reach? Um, and we're also wondering, um, are you aware of any um, desire or appetite in the chemicals industry or in the UK government to move away from mirroring EU reach? So, yeah, absolutely. So, the first point, I'm not concerned that changes to the deadlines are a risk to, to divergence uh, or convergence. Um, I think that uh, the what might replace or change is still very much at the early stages, so I would have to um, withhold my view on that whilst we develop it. But I'll, we will certainly be making the argument for uh, divergence being minimised as far as possible. And I think that, I mean, I, I can't really speak for industry, I can't speak for the UK government, but my impression is that it's about industry's problem is the cost of obtaining the data that's required under UK reach, much of which they don't own, is what, is, what the barrier is. So we will have to find ways to try and overcome that. Um, and that's very much early days, but our position will be to minimise any divergence as far as possible as that develops. Just last question, then I take it the Scottish Government will continue to engage with industry and stakeholders on that point? Yes, we certainly will, and I suspect there will be further consultation on the substance of whatever is expected to replace that, yeah. Thank you. Um, just looking around, are there any other questions, Mark? I cut you off. I could let you in briefly if there was a subsequent question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, for attending today and giving those answers. Um, we we'll want to move on to the next agenda item, if I may. Oh, yes, of course, Minister. I, I'm sure you'll want to slip out and uh, to carry out your other duties while we consider uh, the, the uh, UKSI. So our next item is of business is to formally consider the Type 1 consent notification sent by the Scottish Government relating to the REACH Amendments Regulations 2023 in light of the evidence that we've just heard and the additional letters. Um, and I, before I go any further, I'm just going to remind members that as a farmer, I do use chemicals, so I have some knowledge of, of the chemical system, but just so there's no duplicity about that. If members are content for consent to be given, the committee will write to the Scottish Government accordingly. In writing to the Scottish Government in this way, we have the option to pose questions or to ask to be kept up to date on relevant developments. If the committee is not content for the proposal, we might have to make one of the several recommendations uh, which I could go through. I wondered if there are any comments from uh, committee members on this. Uh, Mark, you wanted to make a comment. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, I think that was a, a, a useful uh, session today, um, looking in some detail at the, at the REACH model, um, both registration and compliance, but also how the whole model is evolving and developing over time. And I just think it's important now, it's post-Brexit landscape, that you know, committees are able to scrutinise how common frameworks are working, uh, how stakeholders are interacting with the development of these regulations going forward. So I felt that was useful. Um, I, I agree that I don't think there is a, an alternative route that is desirable or achievable for Scottish Government to take in relation to this. So I'm, I'm content to accept the, the regulations that are, that are before us. But I do think there's a need for that ongoing scrutiny. And I, I would welcome more information about the alternative registration model as that's developed over time. Um, I think the, the wider model which the Minister talked about, particularly in relation to the points made about divergence and about reviewing existing chemicals that we're all using at the moment, but which may impact on our health or our environment, I think you know, that needs watched as well. So there are, there are questions there about the pace of how that, that uh, development, how that model is developing and the pace of how particular groups of chemicals are being reviewed uh, continually as our knowledge and understanding of their impact um, develops as well. So I think if those, uh, if those points could be reflected in the, in the letter to the Minister, that would be good. And I feel this is the start of a conversation, not the end of it. Um, Fiona, I, think you... yeah, I, I agree with Mark, and I think we should write in those terms to the Scottish Government. Uh, I'm also uh, minded that we should 
um, acknowledge uh, the letter from Rebecca Powell. We obviously wrote it quite short notice following our meeting last week, um, and I think the prompt response was very helpful, and I think we should ind indicate that. I think two things from that letter was, one, um, she refers, uh, the UK Minister refers to the alternative transitional registration model, uh, which I think for UK Reach, which I think we should express our ongoing interest in. And also in that letter, she says, we are conscious of the question of divergence and that both industry and NGO stakeholders wish to keep unnecessary divergence to a minimum. So I suppose our issue is what is necessary divergence, and that's what we want to continue to, to monitor. But I think we should write in those terms and thank the UK Minister for replying so promptly, uh, because this is such an, an, an area of concern. And I'd also agree with Mark that that indication of how common frameworks can and should work is going to be important to us in our ongoing work in looking at implications, particularly for the environment. OK, thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, comments? OK, so on that basis, I'm going to ask uh, the, the substantive question, is, and that is, is the committee content that the provisions set out in the notification uh, should be made to proposed UK statutory instrument? Now, in agreeing that, if we do agree it, we can write to the Scottish Government along the lines that have been suggested, suggesting we want to be kept informed of the pace of, of the change and any review of chemicals in the future, um, which I think would be a useful thing to do. And as part of that, uh, as the Deputy Convener has suggested, we could write to Rebecca Power, thanking her for a prompt response, ask her to, to detail out a bit more information on the alternative transitional registration and what divergence means. So is the committee happy with that? Yes. Okay. Um, the clerks are happy as well, so we know what we're doing. Um, I was going to uh, pause um, the uh, session to allow a changeover of witnesses, but they've done it um, in, in, before, we've, uh, before we've even had a chance to complete our business. So we're going to crack straight on. Our next item of business is an evidence session as part of our inquiry into Scotland's electricity infrastructure, inhibitor or enabler of our energy ambitions. The, just to remind everyone, the aim of the inquiry is to scrutinise what electricity infrastructure will be needed to realise the ambitions set out in the Scottish Government's recently re released draft energy strategy and just, just a transition plan and what will be needed to deliver that infrastructure. This is a short inquiry leading to a report to the Scottish Government as it finalises its strategy. Last week we uh, heard uh, from our in our first evidence session from two panels of key energy uh, industry stakeholders and experts. Today we're going to hear from Ofgem, the government regulator for the electricity markets in Great Britain. We will discuss the evidence heard so far as the Ofgem's views on the delivery of the aims set out in the draft energy strategy and on the decarbonisation of our, there's a lot of long words in this, decarbonisation of our electricity infrastructure. I'm pleased to welcome Stephen Mahone, the Deputy Director of Networks and Head of Scotland Ofgem, and Jack Presley Abbott, Deputy Director for Energy Systems Management and Security Ofgem. Thank you for our, accepting our invitation, and we're delighted to have you both here. Before um, uh, we start. I believe, Stephen, you would, you would like to make an opening statement. Yep. Um, good morning, uh, convener and, and committee members, and, and thanks for inviting us to give evidence this morning. I think, as you said in your introduction, I'm Steve McMahon. Um, I'm head of uh, off James office in Scotland, uh, but I'm also the, the deputy director that leads much of our work on electricity network regulation. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Jack Presley-Abbott, who's also a deputy director based in, in our Glasgow office, and Jack uh, oversees much of our work on connections policy and market design. Now, taking a step back, the IPCC report that was published last week concluded that swift and drastic climate action uh, can avert uh, only swift and, and drastic climate action can avert irrevocable damage to the world. Um, the report runs to thousands of pages, as you'll be aware, but the message is, is crystal clear: either, either we act now, or it will be too late. Um, the evidence has never been as clear. As, as at present, and we, we need truly transformational and accelerated action across every sector, including energy. Now, given what's unfolded uh, across the energy sector, particularly over the last couple of years, 
not least following events in, in Ukraine, alongside um, ambitious government targets for renewables and other forms of generation. We already knew that we needed to accelerate um, uh, the shift away from fossil fuels to clean energy. Um, that will help to reduce cost to customers by breaking the link between electricity bills and gas prices. It protects our security supply uh, and it provides like, secure and reliable homegrown energy. And it helps to protect the cost, uh, customers from the dangers of unmit unmitigated climate change. Um, so basically, we're at the cusp of a transformational shift in the energy system. Probably the biggest changes that anyone involved in the sector will have ever seen. Um, as the economic regulator uh, of that energy sector, with a responsibility to protect, protect consumers and representing their long-term interests, this is a big change uh, to the environment in which we, we operate. Uh, we need to act at pace to enable cost-effective infrastructure investment to transition away from our high dependence on fossil fuels and deliver a homegrown, cheaper and more secure uh, net zero energy system. So over the next 10 to 20 years in particular, that's going to require an immense amount of investment in new network infrastructure that needs to be built in a coordinated way across generation and demand, built both at pace uh, but also at a reasonable cost. Uh, that's the defining challenge that I think we face, ensuring our regulation helps this infrastructure um, to be built as rapidly and efficiently as possible, so that when the wind farms right down to electric vehicles are ready to connect onto the system, the grid capacity is already in place, made possible with accelerated planning, environmental consents and network companies incentivised to deliver on time. The committee's call for evidence specifically poses the question about whether the electricity infrastructure is an inhibitor or an enabler of Scotland's energy ambitions. Our response is that it must be an enabler, and everything that we are doing is geared around ensuring that our economic regulation can help build the system we need at pace, but in a way that protects energy cons consumers both now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, just before we move into questions, uh, I'd like to remind members and those people who are listening that as a farmer and a landowner, I have electricity transmission lines across the farm in the form of 11 kV lines, the small ones, the 33 kV ring mains, which are the bigger ones, and I'm in negotiation with a, for a 132 kV power line to go through the farm. Or at some stage, all of those will generate some income for the farm. So I want to be no doubt that I have some interests, uh, and I will continue to make this declaration as and when I think it's appropriate to do so. I do not think it inhibits me from doing my job as convener, but I want committee members to know that. The first questions, therefore, will come from uh, Mark Ruskell. Mark. Yes, uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, so the draft energy strategy um, discusses a, a range of, of targets um, for onshore wind. Um, there's the potential for a, a target or targets for solar to emerge from the energy strategy as well, perhaps at different scales, embedded, you know, agricultural scale solar as well. Um, and, you know, th th there's, there's marine, you know, potential for marine as well. So c can I ask you about how those targets uh, influence your approach to market design and, and regulation? Um, but can we start with that? So sure. perhaps if we, if we start with solar would be I, useful. I mean, I think more broadly, Clearly, government sets targets. The Scottish government has targets. The UK gov government sets targets, and we see those policy ambitions growing and growing like, every year. Um, how do we treat the targets? Well, the targets are an important part of our responsibility. I think we interpret our remit to deliver the policy ambitions and the decarbonisation targets that are set by government. I think the key thing is then how that then plays into the system planning. I mean, I think you heard in the evidence session last week that we're moving to a kind of more co a coordinated, holistic network planning. And it's important that the policy aspirations, the targets for any source of generation are included in that planning process. I think we also have to work with government just to understand what those targets are, and so does the industry. I think we believe that we can help inform like, those targets and how they are set, um, and like the policies that will sit behind them. Um, sometimes that, that might be the difference in terms of looking at the challenge. Uh, is this deliverable, especially when you're setting very specific targets in specific locations? Can we deliver that, and can we do it in a way that probably avoids like unnecessary costs? So, for any like source, we see the information coming through in terms of the network planning that feeds into the system. 
and then just in terms of like the system architecture that would be in place to deliver against those. Just to add, um, it's clear with, with all the targets that we're going to have an increasingly renewable and therefore variable generation on the system. So in order to do that, we have to consider in terms of market design, ensuring that the signals are there for those assets to operate when they are, gener when they are able to generate, and then there is the flexible technologies there, battery storage, for example, um, that can respond when there are those sort of variability on the system. So we're looking at ensuring... I don't think any of the markets are going to be you know, radically removed or new markets created, but it's more a transformation of current markets that exist to ensure that they work for a very highly renewable and therefore variable generation mix. So specifically then, in terms of the network operator's business plan, how would, say, targets for onshore wind at 20 gigawatts uh, and, sorry, 12 gigawatts, and how would uh, targets for solar impact on that? What, think what you, would practically change yeah, on the ground? I think if you take like offshore and onshore wind at the transmission level, what you've got is the system operator. So we had like the holistic network design, like the first iteration of that was published last year, and it told us here is the network infrastructure that we need to get to 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So that's the first step in that process, and basically like your low regrets investment. What then follows will be further iterations of that. So I think we're due HND two from the existing electricity system operator. That will be published this summer. Um, and that will look at, for example, 25 gigawatts of Scotland, like floating offshore wind in Wales, and look at what additional network infrastructure requirements do we need like from that. And then we've um, tasked the, the system operator with producing something that we call as the centralised strategic network plan. That will be published in 2025. And that will look holistically onshore, offshore targets across the full of GB, and say, what, what is the infrastructure that we need to deliver that, including like, any aspirations and, and targets that the Scottish Government set out? So that's at that level, the kind of transmission level in industry speak. When you're looking at things like solar, it might be that that does connect into the transmission system, but a lot of this is likely to come through in the distribution network. So we see that coming through the future, like distribution future energy scenarios, which then in turns like the business planning process and for the distribution network operators, so SP Energy Networks and SSEN in Scotland, and then they factor that into their investment planning like over the regulatory periods. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Yes, you're coming back in later on, uh, but the next question is coming from Jackie Dunbar. Jackie. Hello, thank you. Good morning. Um, what role do you think Ofgem currently play in developing and regulating hydrogen markets? Uh, you know, what work has been done to date? Yeah, I can I can pick that up. So, it, it, with regards to to hydrogen, the we're still awaiting many of the business models from the, the UK government to deploy um, both hydrogen production and hydrogen storage. Um, in terms of Ofgem's role, it's ensuring that the markets and the market design will work for that. We, we have a market for natural gas. Do we need to then transition to a way where we are able to buy and sell that hydrogen? At present, it's going to be a mechanism by which we have, a play, you know, have facilities that can produce hydrogen, and then we have end users, for example, industry, that, can, that require that hydrogen to decarbonise their processes. So, so in terms of Ofgem's role to date, there hasn't, there hasn't been specific requirement for Ofgem to, to do so because it's, it's, it's an industry that has been stimulated through UK government um, mechanisms. But over time, we, we see it that we, we are going to have to be ready for whatever form that hydrogen market takes, be it a quite sort of specific between buyers and sellers or, or a more bigger traded market in the same way that natural gas is done. Okay. So, um, whose responsibility is it to develop the regulatory regime, I can't say that word, for hydrogen storage, either um, onshore or geologically? You know, and what, what role would, would you have in that? In general, it's our responsibility to make sure that we've got the right regulatory regime, the right regulatory environment across all of the, like, the technologies that we are responsible for. Some of them are established, some of them are going to be new and emerging. 
Um, but we see that as our responsibility. I think when you've got these new technologies emerging, and as, as Jack let set out, we have to work quite closely with government just to understand, well, what is the market arrangements that are in place around that? Some of the commercial drivers that will determine whether these are going to be successful or not but then making sure that we can build that into like our regulation that's built into the system planning that ultimately allows us like where these do materialise and irrespective of where they materialise, can we make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place to support them? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, sorry, can I just push on that a wee bit is that when we heard the evidence session uh, last week, uh, the storage of hydrogen was going to become critical to ensure the uh, supply into the future, i.e. It, it's not a just in time, you know, it, it's something we've got to store. So are you going to have to develop future resources from your, uh, from Ofgem to make sure that, the, that that storage becomes available? Otherwise, it's not going to be a, a fuel that's going to be of huge use to us. Uh, and absolutely, and I think that generally applies across the board. We have to put our resources where it's needed, absolutely. I think if you look at, like, for example, the, the CCC report that was published earlier this month, that, that gave us a good feel for, like, kind of put more flesh in the bones of what, like, the, the system is, the, gener the kind of mix of generation is going to look like in 2030 and 2035. I mean, in terms of obviously the dominant factor there is like wind, onshore and offshore, but hydrogen is a big part of that as well. And I think what they've done is set out how they expect these to be complementary to each other. I think particularly in Scotland, like given the natural resources that we've got, so we, we definitely will make sure that we are resourced to have the right regulatory arrangements in place for hydrogen over time. It's something that is emerging. Though. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next questions come from Colette Stevenson. Colette. Thanks, convener, and good morning. And um, just on um, touching upon um, Ofgem and uh, the energy markets as well, um, I know that the UK Energy Bill at the moment um, uh, is going through the, the House of Lords, but there's a provision in there that um, we establish a future systems operator. Do you know what impact that, that would have with Ofgem, or do you believe that the establishment of an FSO will have on the whole energy system planning? And on that, um, what skills, experience and authority will that FSO have that existing agencies and systems operators uh, do not at this moment in time? FSO work is something that we are very involved with at the moment. It's something that we are incredibly supportive of, I think, alongside um, the UK government. Uh, what, what you're likely to see, we talk about our regulation adapting, you'll, you'll see quite a big shift in the landscape in terms of the institution, the governance arrangements. From our point of view, like the single biggest issue is if you've got an FSO that is responsible for whole system planning, and they're charged with basically taking that responsibility looking back at the, like the GB energy system as a whole and thinking, right, what's the, where, what's the right generation that we mix? Where are we going to see production over time? And what impact does that have in terms of how we orchestrate the system? So there's a lot of responsibility that will sit with them. And that, in turn, I think we have consulted recently, like, for example, in what our future model of economic regulation of the network should look like. And I think we've had a very successful model since privatisation, but that, like everything else, needs to adapt and evolve. And I think the emergence of whole system planning gives us a big opportunity. That can become like the bedrock for network planning. So if you've got the FSO as like a coordinating body across the network that says, right, here is what we need to build, this is where we need it and by when, that then gives us a lot more certainty in terms of the decisions that we need to take. So you potentially, our role might reduce slightly. That's not guaranteed. I think there's different models over time. But certainly that's going to have a really prominent role, I think, going forward. And what you've also got potentially is the, the same happening at distribution level. I mean, when you think about a lot of the decisions that we have to take around net zero, a lot of them are going to be taken at a regional and local level, particularly around the electrification of heat and transport. So can we do that same thing at a regional level? That's further back in our thinking, but we are consulting on that at the moment, particularly around like, the emergence of new regional system planners. So can they create like, that kind of whole system plan at a particular geographic level that re reflects the needs, I think the network needs of that and like, the, the sources of demand and like, the opportunities that are available? So there's two, two parts to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think also just to add is that the, the fact that they're bringing together the gas and electricity systems under one independent entity 
will give it that sort of assurance, enable to give proper strategic advice to regulators and, and to, the, to the governments. Okay, no thanks. And just on, you know, in terms of the Electricity Networks Commissioner, and interact well you know how will that interact and add value to the work you know of Ofgem and the FSO and, and, and basically vice versa as well and is there a potential risk as well that it's becoming crowded a bit fussy in terms of regulatory and, and forward planning on the last point I think the idea is that we try and simplify the landscape as much as possible I know that's an objective of the UK government we've got the work that's on going at the moment, I think, through uh, 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 the, 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 yeah, the, the work that is, I can't remember the chap's name at the moment. Nick Windsor. Nick Windsor, that's it, Nick Windsor. So that's ongoing at the moment. It's expected to report in, in the not-too-distant future. I think that's likely to set quite a, a series of recommendations just around what, what Ofgem should be doing over time, how our model our regulation needs to adapt. I think what he's able to do is look at what are some of the big strategic challenges that we face at the moment around network congestion, around like, connection times, like to get a connection into the grid. Um, and these uh, we look forward to. I think we're working quite closely with the UK government and, and that piece of work, and, and we'll see what the implications are. But generally speaking, I think there is an opportunity to try and simplify the landscape as much as possible, and that you've got like a, a, everybody's laser focused on getting to a net zero energy system as quickly as we can and as efficiently as we can. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you want to come in, Jack, on that. No. no okay. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> convener, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mark. Back to you. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of focus on trying to decouple the gas price from the renewable electricity price. So I wanted to ask you about the, the REMA um, review, the market access review, what your, what your thoughts are on that. Are there, are there proposals workable? Are there particular pros and cons of the current access uh, market arrangements? And um, what, if you could explore that a bit, that would be good. Yeah, so... The review of electricity market arrangements is, is, is very welcome and, and as I alluded to earlier it's that the scale of the challenge and the scale of the fact that we're going to have a largely decarbonised power system so with a huge amount of renewables on the system means that we need to take a real good look at the market arrangements to make sure that they're fit for that fit for purpose for that sort of energy mix. So I think it's it's important that you know, off -gem, it's, a, it's a UK government-led um, scheme, and they're looking at sort of different elements, which I think are the right areas. So, how do we deploy mass low carbon in a way that does it at lowest cost, but doesn't impact the system from an operational perspective? How do we ensure security of supply when those assets are low carbon? Much of the, our security supply is at the moment uh, delivered by fossil fuels. Delivering that flexibility uh, that we need when there's those lulls in renewable generation. And then finally, where we've been putting our, our focus is, are the arrangements appropriate in the wholesale market, the market where we buy and sell um, wholesale electricity? You know, are they appropriate? Do they work in a, in a larger decarbonised system? And so from, from Ofgem's perspective, we've seen real value in, in really assessing whether there is a need for more locational signals within that wholesale market. So indicating to people, to parties, that they are they can site in the most optimal location for the system, taking into account network, taking into account demand, and then also being used on the system in the, in the most efficient way. So we've been undertaking quite a lot of analysis about that, the cost benefits case, the, the, the trade-offs that need to be really considered as part of that, if you were to introduce what is a very significant change to the market's arrangements. So we've been working through that. It's still ongoing, um, but we, we, we intend to feed that into the the REMA process and also publish that more broadly. Um, so it's focusing on the right areas. We, we believe there is a case for making sure there's better, more granular signals to ensure that parties are using that system as efficiently as possible and can deploy in the right places at the right times. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the next question has come from Liam. Thank you, Kavir. Good morning, panel. Uh, First of all, it's been suggested that Ofgem has an ambiguous relationship with net zero, and there were proposals in a recent UK government white paper uh, to amend your statutory duties to include a specific reference to net zero. 
Do you have a view, Stephen? I'll put this to you first. Uh, what would expressly changing off GEM's statutory duty to include achieving net zero actually mean in relation to regulation and design of markets and networks? Yeah, and it's a good question. I mean, it's something that's often talked about. I think, I mean, we obviously work under a, a, a statutory remit set by the UK government. Uh, or that remit is to protect existing and future, uh, future customers. Like we interpret that responsibility around future customers to include like, achieving the net zero targets that are set by government. Um, the, the, whether, whether there's a net zero objective on us, I don't think it would make a practical difference to us. I mean, because ultimately we're already doing the things that we think we need to do to deliver net zero. I think there is a chance, like through, I think there's the upcoming strategy and policy statement, a consultation on that, that may well give us an explicit duty around net zero or other clarifications around our role. But I think in practice, I don't think it would change that much because we're already doing the sort of stuff that's implied by it. Um, no, on you go. Keep going. Yeah. I'll, I'll bring Fiona in later. I think she's going to wrap up some questions at the end. I'm very grateful. Uh, so secondly, then, the Climate Change Committee have said that we massively need to ramp up transmission infrastructure. Now, as I understand it, Ofgem sets uh, price controls uh, for SPEN and SSEN, which regulate how much can be spent on investment and infrastructure. And I noted in your submission that on at least one metric, they asked for, those two companies asked for 17% more for EDT2 than they were actually given. Now, given all of that, how will you ensure, how will Ofgem ensure that the next transmission and distribution network price control periods, so, i.e. post-26, post-28, will actually deliver the investment and redesign of the network that we need? So we're currently consulting at the moment, as you say, that we, we, we set the last of the real two generation of price controls. So the new one for electricity distribution actually starts this Saturday, um, the 1st of April. Um, we alluded to some of the fingers there. I think that represents like the overall challenge against the submitted costs by the distribution network operators or the individual SP Energy Networks or SSE for the, the Scottish license areas. And that really is us like making sure that they are delivering efficiently and in the best interest of their customers. I think if you take a step back, I mean, like the, the real model of regulation that we've had in place for 20, since 2013, that has really like evolved over time. These are very agile and adaptive price controls. So yes, it's right that you have like an ex ante set funding settlement for the companies that says, right, here is the amount of money that we are confident that we can set up front and you can charge your customers in return. Here is the network, like the, the level of service quality that has to go alongside that. Here is the, like the challenges that we are setting on your cost efficiency. But what we've got increasingly now is in period uncertainty mechanisms. I think there may have been some discussion in the session that you had last week. And that allows us basically to adapt investment over time. So to track the changes that you see in the economy, because there might be new requirements on the transmission network and the distribution network. And it's good for the companies because it gives them a route to fund an end period. And it's good for customers because it avoids like, any mistargeted or inefficient or unnecessary like, investment up front. So that adaptability, I think, gives us comfort like, for the here and now in terms of we can evolve over time. I think to address like the net zero targets. I mean, if you look at the transmission side, the ASTI programme is a great example in that. Last year, an additional like, £20 billion of network investment on the transmission grids to, to give us what we, we think we need to, to deliver the 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by, by 2030. And we are constantly, I think, evolving these price controls over time. There's quite a big discussion at the moment in terms of like, beyond 2026 and 2028, do we need to do things differently? I think quite possibly yes. I think the, like, going back to the, the previous question about the, like, the, the system architecture, what it looks like, institutions and government governance, they're evolving. So our price control, our regulation of the network should evolve as well over time. But we don't have like, a preset like, solution on that. It's subject to consultation. But one thing we can say is it will be adaptable to allow us to meet the net zero targets. Very grateful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liam. Uh, Monica, you've got some questions. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, 
colleague Liam Kerr mentioned the CCC report already, as have yourselves. Um, but I wanted to come back to that um, report on delivering a reliable, decarbonised power system. And it does suggest that a step change is necessary in the delivery of transmission infrastructure to meet both UK and Scottish Government targets for renewable generation. So I just wanted to explore with you in a bit more detail what you see as the as the, the, the main practical constraints that Ofgem face in delivering this. You've mentioned a few examples already, but you know, what are the, the main challenges and can you give us a bit more clarity about what needs to be put in place to support um, this increase in deployment that, that everyone wants to see? Um, I'm happy to start off. I Thank think you. that for us, the, there's a number of big challenges to, that we face. I think quite a lot of coverage, obviously, at the moment around network congestion, so the system balancing costs that we face in GB at the moment, um, and then the related problem in terms of like, connection queues to get a connection into the grid. We can influence that, I think, through our regulation. Uh, we, we have the ability to obviously accelerate, accelerate the network expansion. Um, alongside that, we can look at what can be done to reform like, the connections policy. So these are things that are more within our gift, working with the companies, the network companies, and working with government. I think aside for that, there, there's probably two big things that we need to see happening over time. One is around planning and consenting. I think you've had some evidence on that um, in the previous session. Like, we need government to be getting like, on with planning and consenting so that that's not holding us back from delivering the infrastructure. And the other thing is around like, the network companies really getting on top of their procurement and managing, uh, management of the supply chains. And if you take like, the right regulations in place, I think the right market arrangements, as Jack was describing earlier, that enabling environment in terms of planning and consents and companies that are managing like, the supply chain issues, then if all these things come together in concert, then we can achieve the sort of like ambitions that are set out in the CCE or the challenges that are set out in the CCC report. Thank you. You mentioned a couple of things here, so planning and consents, and then you talked about the network companies themselves and procurement um, being an issue. So to try to understand these so-called blockers and how we can kind of unblock these these systems, what is the issue? Is it a, a lack of people? Is it a personnel issue? Is it a skills issue? Um, has Ofgem done any work at looking at um, the skills mix um, across the sector? Um, just try to understand when people say these are the things that are slowing things down. Um, are, are you looking for less regulation or is there something in there about the, the number of people and the skills that they have? Probably a mix of everything. I mean, when you think about it, they sound very simple problems to overcome, but even planning, I mean, from the outside, you might think, well, planning's all devolved in Scotland, so it must be a matter for the Scottish Government, but there's some subtleties in terms of how that works in practice and the interaction with the Electricity Act that it makes it more complicated, and we know that the Scottish and UK Government are working quickly, I think, to try and resolve that. So that's something that's there. I think we're planning. When you need the amount of infrastructure that we need, that has an impact on communities like across the country. So we need to be able to bring them with us. Like we, we know that there's not probably an alternative to low carbon infrastructure. We need more wires, we need more cables that can have a disruptive impact. So I think um, it's probably incumbent upon all of us that are involved to work with the regional and local authorities to make sure that we're bringing them through and listening to their concerns and responding to them and that you get like, truly com like, community benefits and lasting benefits from it. I think... Oh. Answer up, but do you have a view on whether the National Planning Framework 4 will help with any of this or do you feel that planning needs to be a, a, a higher priority for government nationally? I think, generally speaking, the NPF 4, I think, is seen as pretty world-leading, like, certainly in a European context, and you've got to applaud, I think, the Scottish Government for the work that they've done on that. Now, whether it's enough, I'm not sure as regulator we are best placed to probably advise on that, but I think certainly from the panel last week that there's improvements or further improvements that can be made, made around it. Uh, on, on, the, on the the kind of procurement and supply chain issues, the, the, the challenge that we've got is that you've got a number of countries that are also moving at pace, whether that be in the States or in mainland Europe. Um, and there can sometimes be physical constraints on the market, its ability to respond. You've got long-term procurement in countries like Germany and the Netherlands. So I think for us, it's like, what can the networks do to make 
investment attractive as well? Is it long kind of bundled procurement strategies that, that they can take forward to make sure that you're getting the supply chain involvement? Um, and also on people and skills, I mean, depending on which number you believe, across, I think, GB overall, you might need between 250,000 and 500,000 additional skilled workers in the industry. So that's a huge potential. So I think working with the government, I think the Scottish government, its, its agencies in Scotland, uh, the universities, the colleges, there's, there's a mobilisation that needs to happen there to make sure that we've got the right people coming through with the skills that we need to deliver all this. I don't know if Jack wants to add anything. No, I, I mean, I can speak around the connections queue itself as well, which is, which is a which is a challenge you know we, we build the network to connect the parties that are in the queue so we have a very because of the success of allowing people to connect prior to all the network being built and also just the sheer investment that is proposed for net zero we have a huge amount of assets that are planning to connect and get a grid connection um, and so there is a question about okay We've got these parties in the queue. Which of these are, are going to realistically deliver? Because if you can actually identify those parties that are not progressing at the speed that you want them to do, or they're not viable projects, then they need to be removed from the, the queue that we call the, 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 as quickly as possible, because they are blocking. Because we operate in the first come, first served, as in you put in your connection application and get an offer, you must be connected uh, before the person that's next in the queue. So if a party is not progressing, then they are blocking others in the queue. So we're looking at whether we can speed up the removal of those projects that are non-viable, ensuring that the network companies and the system operator are really considering appropriate assumptions, because if they assume everything before it's in the queue is built, then you're going to be quoted a date which is uninvestable, because you are having to assume that all these parties are connecting. So if we take more realistic assumptions, we can bring those dates down, assuming we can then remove them from the queue. Move on, but I think that point about viability is important. Yeah. You've mentioned the queue a couple of times here. I just wonder how long is the queue? I've read that for some projects, they've been quoted a connection date of 2035. Um, does that sound about right? It does sound about right. In, in certain areas, it's not a nationwide... Um, okay. Queue, but there are there are areas where you are seeing date, um, parties quoted that date, and, and and that is also the case for parties at a local level because if they trigger uh, reinforcement work, so it's about removing those to bring those dates down. Okay, is that the furthest away date, 2035, or are there any dates beyond that? Um, I, th I think that's they're, they're the sort of 2035 is the longest I've heard, and there may be other cases, but okay. thank you. Um, and, and good luck at getting a quote for 2035, I, I suspect, for connection to the grid. Um, that may prove difficult. Uh, the Deputy Convener wants to come in with some questions. Fiona. So I think we're getting to the nub of the issue here um, and the concerns. Uh, clearly, when you have queues, you have potential for delays for a number of reasons. Uh, currently, in terms of the investable proposition, because clearly you've got to create the conditions for market investment, and um, all the risk for grid delays currently lie with the developer and the generators. Um, is there anything you can do to rebalance that? Um, you imply that you would want to investigate the uh, viability of some of the proposals. Uh, that is a shift from enabler to probably, dare I say, market interrogator. Is, is, is that what you're suggesting will lead to greater flexibility, adaptability and investment? regards to those in the, the queue and the queue yeah, management, yeah. well, what, what it is is that there are sort of a few things we can do, and the, the earlier and the, the things we can do sooner is about introducing milestones for parties that are progressing their projects, that if they do not hit those milestones, then they will be removed from the queue. So that, that's, that's what I mean by saying if they're not meeting those milestones, then that and we, we're yet to approve this, but if they don't hit those milestones, then they will be removed from the queue. So it keeps those projects in the queue progressing towards delivery. D is, does that answer the question you were... Uh, yes, but for, in a market, uh, in a, in a market condition basis, that is quite a, a kind of interesting, I suppose, state uh, involvement in that, um, in, in that operation. But... It's, it's, 
it's, it's, a, it's the regular, it's not the regulator. The regulator approves the, the milestones. And the idea is that for each milestone, you're getting closer to the amount, of, you, you have to build a network to facilitate those assets onto the system. So it's just making sure that when the network companies need to start investing in a new substation, for example, they are increasingly confident that those projects will, will be there. Because if they don't have the confidence and then build the network, and then the, that project does not turn up, then you, you've, you've spent money on network which isn't being utilised. In terms of uh, where we are, this concern has been raised with us that um, Ofgem are not as uh, adaptable and as flexible as they need to be. Uh, you have plans for the future, you've, you've said that. But in terms of you know, mobilising that immense amount of investment that you yourself have said are, are needed, um, why, why are you so slow just now? Is that um, because you haven't in the past uh, allowed investment in anticipation of need, but ASTI, etc., you've said that you're, you're improving that. So you know, what is that trajectory? Because um, you know, this has got to accelerate at a huge pace. And how do people have confidence and how do investors have confidence that Ofgem will be fit for purpose for what we need for that renewable energy expansion? I think... On, on, it's, uh, yeah, it's an important point because this, this idea that, that our regulation prevents investment ahead of need or has done, that's just not true. There's nothing in our rules or regulations that prevent in investment ahead of need. In fact, like under, like, for any network company under the licence, there's a requirement for them to be economic, efficient and coordinated in how they deliver and just discharge their responsibilities. Now, when you're in, installing assets that are 45 years in life, it's entirely reasonable that you should expect like, that obligation to include what is the demand that's likely to be materialised over time and how do I then size like, my intervention in response to that. So that, that is for the companies to make the case. There's nothing in our regulation that has pre uh, prevented it. I think what you might probably get if you were to push a company and say, well, it's behavioural. Like Ofgem is the regulator, like in the last 10 to 15 years, has been so preoccupied with cost efficiency. And in some ways we have. I mean, we don't probably apologise for that because ultimately all of these costs go through into consumer bills and we want to make sure they are efficient. But we certainly don't stand in the way of good investment cases for investing ahead of need. Now, what you've seen over the last few years, like the ASTI reference is a good one. Like, that is investment ahead of need. Even before that, like the Green Recovery Programme that we announced in 2021, 300 million across GB, I think it was about 50 million in Scotland. Again, anticipatory investment at the distribution level to support more EVs, heat pumps, more local, uh, low carbon generation. So I think we have shown that it can be done. And what you have like, unequivocally now is a mindset from the leg regulators. We have no option but to invest ahead of need. And we're encouraging the networks to do that, but do it efficiently. And in terms then, of uh, your, I suppose, existing responsibilities, particularly for customers, and that is where the location is in terms of the demand. Uh, what we have seen, however, from the generating point of view and the transmission point of view, you've seen uh, charging costs, uh, particularly transmission costs, increasing rapidly in Scotland. Now, that provides uncertainty, and we know business doesn't like uncertainty if they want to then invest at the immense amounts of investment you've referred to. So, is, is there something that needs to be done there to make sure that there are clear positive signals for investment? And has that dichotomy, which you know, has, has existed to date, uh, going to change in the future? I'll come to Jack. Jack's probably more of the expert on charging reforms. But generally speaking, as a matter of principle, yes, we have to look across the full range of our regulation. So the network regulation, charging arrangements and things. Like the things that have held true in the past, do they still hold true for the future? Because it's a very different energy system that we're likely to have. I think traditionally when you have like more rural projects, obviously there's two big costs that are involved in that. There's the actual cost of the investment itself, and then there's the cost of connecting it into the grid. And the further that you ha are away from demand, the higher the cost is in terms of the network that you like, have to transport that electricity. And there's a trade-off there, because I think when we've had the debate in the past about charging arrangements, if you want the generators to pay less, then consumers have to pay more. 
So it's, 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 it's a zero-sum game, so there, there is a trade-off that has to be assessed, but it is under review. I don't know, Jackie, if you want to pick up on the detail. Yeah, yeah, so uh, absolutely. The, the trans we have to recover the cost, so that's what the transmission charges are doing. They, they recover the cost of the, of the transmission network. Um, I, th I think it's just to say that we are looking at it from, from two angles from regards to the transmission charging. Is In the interim, are we sure that the assumptions are being used are based on you know, the system today rather than when the transmission charging regime was set up. Um, so we are going through what's, what's called the TANUOS task force to ensure that um, those assumptions that we're using to calculate those charges are, are accurate and provide cost-reflective signals but also give a, a, a level of stability for parties to, to be able to, to invest. Secondly, as we've spoken about the review of electricity market arrangements, what, what's the purpose of transmission charging when you have a changed electricity market? And so that's a separate piece of work. They are coordinated, but do, does, do you want transmission charging to be sending a signal when you have a different market arrangement? It's something that we're thinking about further. In thinking about it, bearing in mind Scotland has the most expensive transmission uh, costs in, in, in Europe, as far as we are aware, and in terms of your other responsibility for pricing for customers, we also have some of the most severe fuel poverty from a customer point of view. So there's clearly a mismatch there, and the reason that we can generate so much renewable energy is precisely because of the rural nature of our geography and also um, our offshore and our coastal lines that accesses the wind. So there's definitely a mismatch here, and I think it's the speed of decisions. So when will these uh, pieces of work you're talking about, uh, when will they emerge in terms of changing that policy and then obviously giving more uh, certainty for investment? And then I've got one final question, if that's OK. Yeah, so we, we restarted. We, over the winter, we, we had to reprioritise our work. The, the, the Transmission Task Force is restarting uh, next month. To it, it already started, so it's not a new project. It's the restarting of that and then working at pace. We've resourced that appropriately to ensure that we can get changes in place to improve the current framework with those incremental improvements around cost effectivity and stability over 2024 and 2025. In terms of the longer term design of those, that is linked to the review of electricity market arrangements, which is a 2030. So that's why we do, because of the importance of those charges, that's why there are two coordinated but separate pieces of work to ensure that there are the near term signals that parties can still keep investing, but also that in the longer term that they, are, they play an appropriate role so that we're not you know, giving conflicting signals when we have a, a changed, potentially a change in reformed electricity market. So it's just to, just to clarify is that we are doing those two pieces of work. They are coordinated, but we need two because of the near term importance of that charging and also the importance of coherence in the long term. And uh, finally, how, how does Ofgem plan to ensure that the electricity distribution network is ready for the anticipated increases in demand, particularly for heat and also transport and uh, electrification? And how are you planning for the potential reduction in demand for the gas distribution network? Yeah, I could, just, just um, if I may, just the, the previous issue around the Chinuos charges. I mean, it's right, it's a fact that Scottish com consumers pay the lowest transmission charges in anywhere in GB. I think when you're looking at the generator side, that's when the picture looks different. But in terms of the, the distribution network, so we've just settled the new regulatory price control for electricity distribution, as I said before, it starts on Saturday. Um, at the start, like the big strategic objective of that is how do we make sure the distribution networks are ready to deliver net zero? This is where much of the anticipatory investments come in for EV charging and heat pumps. So there's a couple of things that we've done there. One is basically doubling the annual investment that's made in network upgrades in the distribution sector. So that's a, a really sizable increase across all of the DNOs, including the two Scottish licensees. But also going back to the point that was made before, we have very agile funding mechanisms in place so that if demand materialises faster than we expect, then the investment can track that. Most of the stuff or most of the big challenges that you might have at like lower voltage um, levels, we have automatic uncertainty mechanisms in place. So there isn't an administrative rule for off-gem up front. It basically, we have a unit cost and then if they have to do more work, then the funding can, can match that. So like these, these mechanisms make sure that the networks are going to be prepared to deliver net zero. 
On the gas question, I think that's, that's one of the big questions that we've got. What is the role of the gas networks going forward? I don't think we've got all the answers to that. I think that in terms of we still await like, some of the government um, 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 policies on like, the future of heat. Um, so at the moment, we have an asset there that has to be managed. Like, there's big safety issues. We have to operate, renew, replace the, 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 the infrastructure. Like the existing gas price controls run until 2026. As we said before, we're currently consulting on the regulatory arrangements beyond that that will take a longer-term view on what the requirements might be of that gas network. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, you want to come back with a brief question? Just on that, that Tineros review, uh, I mean, is it, is it accepted that the locational signals need to change? Because as, as far as I see it, the, the locational signalling at the moment is to build as much generation as close to the theoretical centre of the GB energy market as possible, which I think is Warwick. Now, last time I looked, I don't think building, you know, renewable energy close to Warwick will have as, you know, as, as big a efficiency and load factor as building renewables in Scotland. You know, you get more energy out of wind farms in Scotland than you would in, in you know, in the Midlands of England. So, what is that kind of recognised that locational signals need need to change now through to know So we need to be accessing and you know, developing the resource where that resource is, rather than... So it's... We're looking at this to... And like you said, the central point is, is one of those assumptions, the underpinning assumptions that we want to make sure is accurate in terms of calculating those transmission charges. So we are... We want to ensure that the, the charges are as cost-reflective for today's system rather than a presumed, you know, historic centre. We need to balance that need to have a really cost-reflective signal, really accurate, with the ability for parties to know what the signal is and the stability of that signal. So there is this, which is why we're convening industry experts to sort of try and find that balance between the stability and the cost-reflectivity. Again, it's, it, the, the role of the, the chargers is to recover the cost of the transmission network. So it, it, it's a zero-sum game. We, in, in, we have to recover those costs. So it, in, in terms of should it change, I think we're reviewing how it's more incremental improvements we're looking at in terms of the nearer term, the 24-2025 changes. In the long term, there is a, there is a question about whether, whether those signals need to be completely different or in fact no signal sent at all through the transmission charging but the crux of it is that we still need to recover the cost of the network through the, those signals does that answer the yeah okay uh, Liam you want to come in do you thanks Kavino yes very briefly to come back on some of the questions earlier which I thought were interesting uh, on the time scales and processes and, it, and it's simply this I was recently out at a, uh, a, a big company who have some really exciting plans on building renewables and building uh, infrastructure. But they are restricted or inhibited in doing so because what they told me was that they need to apply for the grid connection very many years in advance, uh, a grid connection that they'll start paying for in advance of actually putting electricity into the grid. Uh, however, only once they've gone through that, then they need to get planning then they'll need to get the kit, then they'll need to get the skills to fit it. Uh, and so when they stacked all of that up, the, the question becomes, if, if we accept that that process, that timescale, that upfront investment is potentially going to restrict innovation and development, or at least limit it to very, very large companies who can go through all of that, do you take a view on what precisely needs to change in Scotland and which agency or body in Scotland needs to lead that change to encourage the step change in renewables investment that we all want to see? I don't think it probably I don't think the responsibility sits with any individual party. I think you need the whole system government, regulator, industry, all working in concert to achieve that. I think we've got all our different bits of the system that we are responsible for, and clearly all of these things need to be properly lined up. I think on the, when you look at the, the connection challenges that we've got at the moment, like a big change was in 2010, where we moved from, like prior to 2010, basically, if you wanted to connect like renewables, the grid capacity had to exist at that point. In 2010, that changed, and it was more connect and manage. So the focus was 
get the connection made in the short term, and then we'll deal with like, the network implications like over time. And that model had a lot of success because you had significant growth in your renewable generation. I think the challenge now is just the scale of that that's coming through, and effectively the network investment is playing catch up. So we know this goes back to the kind of fundamental point of we need strategic investment. It's more like strategic expansion of the grid so that when it's a wind farm or whatever um, developer, whatever form of generation wants to connect in, then they have something there that is, that's available. Um, and that probably goes alongside like, some of the reforms that, that Jack's talking about. I don't know whether you wanted to pick up on any of the detail on in connections. In connections, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's we still need to do all those steps, the planning, the, the grid connection, procuring the equipment. It's just a question about whether it could be more streamlined. And with regards to grid connection, I, I've, I spoke about them recently, but it, it, there is a case that, like I said, if, if this party is looking to connect today, they are behind all those other parties that have already applied to connect in the queue. And so again, it comes to that point is, are those parties in advance of the queue going to deliver? If not, how do we remove them as quickly as possible? And th there is a question about, could we, if parties are ready, when even though they're behind them in the queue, can we in some way expedite their delivery without, to, without detrimenting others in the queue? So I think we just need to think a bit more, um, ad, in a more agile way about how do we manage those connections? As, as, at the moment, it's first come, first serve. We just go through it in an orderly way. Whereas could we think more or could the networks and the system operator manage that with support from us in a more agile way to, to deliver quicker those assets and those parties that are ready today? Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Um, and I'm going to ask a question at the end, uh, having uh, been quiet during this meeting, is, is that having watched the Bewley denny power line go up and the t length of time it took to, to build that, having watched the substation being built at Bewley getting bigger and bigger, and a substation being built at Black Hillock getting bigger and bigger, and the problems and consternation it causes with local people who, who live near it or see it. Do you think the correct signal would be that actually what we want to be doing is transmitting this as hydrogen um, in pipe networks under the country, which seem to take less infrastructure and are less a scar on the landscape? And do you think that's a signal that, that everyone should be putting out? Or is that too simplistic? Stephen. That's um, a good question. I think clearly, like, when you look at like, the electricity infrastructure, it's not viable, economically viable, to have that all running underground because the cost of it would be prohibitive. Um, I also think that when you're looking at it, could you, do we have the confidence at the moment that you could rely purely on hydrogen? Probably not, but it certainly does have a role to play. I think it's about looking at these things in totality. So what does the system need like, for like, reliable and improving operability and delivering that net zero system? Um, but there will be, I think there could be opportunities, I think especially in terms of the future of the gas networks, how do you potentially convert that? into hydrogen over time. Like a lot of innovation work is going on around that at the moment where we explore it. Can it be done? Can it be safe? Can it be viable? Um, so that's something I think we keep an open mind around. Jack. I think just, just quickly to... Um, we have a, a system that's electrified. It will increasingly become electrified. Um, so like, like Steve said, so there is a role for hydrogen, especially in those hard to decarbonise sectors, potentially in, in other, other roles such as managing the power system. Um, but I think we just need to remember that with regards to electricity, if you convert it to hydrogen, there is, a, there is a, an efficiency drop. So every time you convert electricity to hydrogen and back to electricity, then you, you lose through losses some of that um, useful power so we should be using that when we need it but uh, we need to th balance that efficiency and those losses against actually if we just need the electricity we want to get the electricity from one point to the other and, and of course you're right jack and the, there is also transmission losses as you generate and move electricity around the countryside on, on power lines and i understand the difficulties of putting a 400 kV uh, power line underground. We discussed it on the Bewley to Denny line. It is possible. Things are moving forward. Just because what you've got 
is what you've got doesn't mean it's right for the future. And on that note, perhaps we should end that. And I'm going to suspend the meeting now for five minutes to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you very much for attending.
Okay, and welcome back to our uh, to the committee meeting. Our next item of business is an evidence session with Circularity Scotland as part of our consideration of the deposit return scheme. And I refer members to the papers for this item. Circularity Scotland will have a crucial role as the scheme administrator, and today's session is about hearing more about that role and overall preparedness for the scheme's launch. And I'm pleased to welcome David Harris, the Chief Executive, Irene Steele, the Chief Finance Officer, Simon Jones, the Chief Operating Officer, and Donald McCalman, the Programme Director, Circularity Scotland. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I'd also like to welcome Fergus Ewing, Maurice Golden, and Brian Whittle in attendance for today's session. I'll offer you a brief opportunity to ask your questions near the end of the panel, uh, so the committees can ask their question first. Uh, I believe, David Harris, you'd like to make an opening statement. Thank you, convener. And thank you very much to you and the other members of the committee for this opportunity to speak to you this morning. We recognise the parliamentary business and public interest in the deposit return scheme and in us as the scheme administrators, and we welcome the opportunity to appear before you today. The four of us sitting before you today, collectively, we have over 100 years experience in recycling, packaging, the drinks industry, fast-moving consumer goods, logistics and the retail sector. I'm joined by Irene Steele, our Chief Financial Officer. Irene has managed financial operations for Marks & Spencer, Heineken, the Edrington Group, and was most recently Finance Director of Genius Foods. Simon Jones, to my far left, our Chief Operating Officer, has 25 years' experience in retail and logistics, and has worked across the UK with Tesco and DHL. To my right, our Programme Director, Donald McCalman, has managed major transformation projects across utilities, financial services, entertainment and the public sector. As Chief Executive, I bring extensive experience from leadership roles in the plastics and the recycling industry. The Deposit Return Regulations 2020 place new legal obligations on producers and retailers to ensure that the scheme objectives are met. It's a type of legislation in the category of producer responsibility, which means producers have to take more operational and financial responsibility for the containers in which their drinks are sold. In simple terms, each producer must collect and process 90% of their containers to ensure that, the fee that fees and deposits are paid to retailers. In practice, individual producers cannot operate independently to achieve this. So Circularity Scotland has been established solely to deliver those responsibilities collectively on behalf of all producers who appoint us as their service provider. I'm sure we'll cover the detail of how we were set up and are managed and operated during today's proceedings. We would like to say at the outset that we're proud to be involved in administering the deposit return scheme. We'll make Scotland a cleaner, greener place to live by ensuring the materials are recycled to the highest standards and by reducing litter. At the outset of this session, I would also like to personally offer my assurances that I un understand all of you as elected members will have engaged extensively with businesses and producers in your constituencies, some of whom may have concerns about the operation of the scheme. The team at Circularity Scotland is working incredibly hard to implement solutions to common concerns from businesses and to work through the scheme implementation on a one-to-one -one basis with individual businesses as appropriate. We have a team who are resourced, ready and willing to help. So if you have businesses in your constituency who are concerned, please put them in touch with us. To provide some information about Circularity Scotland's constitution, we are an independent, not-for-profit, membership-based organisation. Our members include drinks producers, retailers and trade associations. And together they account for more than 90% of the scheme articles sold and returned in Scotland. We are governed through a membership agreement that all members sign, which sets out our guiding principles. Our members vote on the appointment of our directors, who are all individuals of substantial industry experience. We were tasked with building the infrastructure for the deposit return scheme, which were the largest waste management operation in the UK. We were charged with doing this within 15 months, 
and to do so without any start-up resource. From that point, we have secured £100 million of investment, have a team of almost 50, and together with our contractor, Biffa, we will be creating 600 jobs. Although the deposit return scheme is new to Scotland, it is not new in other parts of the world. We have sought to learn from the growing amount of international experience. The deposit return scheme represents a major shift in Scotland's approach to recycling, and it will have an impact on every part of the country. We know you have legitimate questions about the implementation of the scheme, and we look forward to answering those questions to the best of our ability. We understand that there is some confusion about the role of various organisations in the development, execution and regulation of Scotland's deposit return scheme, and we welcome the opportunity to attend this committee and help clarify the objectives of Circularity Scotland. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, David. I'll just remind members what we're trying to do here is get to the hub of, or the nub of the problem and to identify the issues. Uh, I notice, and I just say as convener, quite a lot of um, uh, interesting responses in the chamber, which are, are best for the chamber. This is actually to try and delve down into the nitty gritty of the problem. And I do hope members will support me in, in, in achieving that. So I'm going to start off with the first question, uh, if I may. Um, membership of uh, Circularity Scotland. Um, it's, it's pretty high bar, 10 million containers, 20 million containers on return, trade associations with more than 10 million. I mean, what slightly concerns me is how the smaller person the smaller producer or retailer feels that they're actually represented in Circularity Scotland and their views are heard. Um, seems to be a, a, a big scheme with big players um, and, and ignoring the little players. David, do you want to answer that? Thank you, convener. Um, I'm going to ask Donald, who was involved in setting the company up, to provide a little more detail on this. But the first part of the answer to that question is that our membership involves trade associations. Trade associations, three of which represent convenience stores, so the, the smaller the SME end of, of retail. But also, if we look across the trade associations on the producer side, we have Wine and Spirits Trade Association, we have the Society of Independent Brewers, much more geared towards small companies, and also people like the British Beer and Pub Association and the British Soft Drinks Association, as nominee, are representing many small SME-sized businesses. I think it would be helpful if Donald gave some more clarity around how the business was brought into being and how, how these rules were set. Please, Donald. Certainly. Um, if we actually go back before the company was established, the um, deposit return scheme has always been set up as an industry-led initiative. Um, and before the legislation was actually laid, uh, four organisations, four producers and three trade associations got together to start thinking out how will industry respond to the new obligations that's coming their way. So three of those organisations were trade associations representing a broad range of organisations size-wise. And it was that group which came up with the general model of the membership criteria to try and reflect the fact that, yes, large organisations probably have more say, but absolutely have more of a role uh, and a commitment to make with regards to the overall recycling target, but also to ensure that the smaller organisations had a vehicle to ensure their views were expressed as well. And that model was essentially codified into what you've summarised, Convener, so that um, of our 32 members, I think something like six or seven are trade associations. Those trade associations represent some of the smallest brewers and retailers uh, in the country, but through the very competent and vociferous um, presence that their trade association has on the membership uh, of, of the company absolutely have their views heard to the same extent as, as others around the table. Okay, um, I hear what you say. I'm not sure if I was uh, a convenience store in, in a local village that I would feel that, that I was getting the representation that I needed. And, and I'll come back to that, if I may, at the end. So I'm going to go to the first set of questions, which come from uh, Jackie Dunbar. Jackie. Thank you, and good morning, panel. Um, what I plan to do is I've got a number of questions, so I'll leave it in your hands who's best um, to, to, uh, to answer them, if you don't mind. Um, my first question is regarding the 
the challenge that's been flagged up with the, the gateway reviews in, in regards to transitioning uh, the DRS scheme from something that is government-owned um, to being industry-led. Can you maybe explain to me how the transition is working? And are you confident that the different roles in the scheme, um, including those ones of yourselves, SEPA, Zero Waste Scotland and Government, are clear? Um, and do businesses know where to go to, to get the support that they're needed? Well, um, there is, we clearly have clarity about where our responsibility lies. We are industry's vehicle for meeting industry's responsibilities under these regulations. It's the job of government to set the regulations. It's the job of SEPA to enforce and regulate. So that they are our, our regulator. And we, whether it be as a member or as someone who registers for us to be their producer, their, their scheme administrator as a producer, or someone who registers with a stop rate return point, we answer to them. They're, they are our customer. They are our master in this regard. What we have found is that overall, and I mean across society, there is a lack of a clear understanding of how these roles are defined. We seek at length to communicate this. We have ex communicated extensively. Obviously, we have websites. We, we write to affected businesses. We seek to find affected businesses. We have online marketing and marketing campaigns to communicate with businesses so they understand where we fit into this. We've also we've been on the road. We've held conferences and roadshows and spoken face to face with 1,500 businesses affected to try and get the message out and help to clarify. We found it, being quite open, frustrating at the level of media coverage, which is not dealing with the facts of the work that we are trying to achieve, exactly what our role is in this. You know, we are not an arm of government. We are here because industry has accepted its responsibilities. We are working hard. We keep expanding our communications capability to do everything that we can to enable people to understand this. And it's why we do not say it lightly when we ask that you have constituents who are concerned. We have a team sitting in Glasgow waiting to talk to them. We want to take business by the hand and support them through this process. Donald, you. If I could add one more point, uh, Convener. Um, those of you who read some of the earlier Gateway Review reports will have seen recommendations about establishing a joint communications group uh, made up of the Scottish Government, Zero Waste Scotland, uh, SEPA, the regulator, and ourselves. And I think it's fair to say in the early days there was an element of miscoordination. Those organisations, to a greater or lesser degree, wanted to have uh, conversations with businesses uh, around the specific roles they play, because they do have very clear, separate, defined roles. Um, and, and we took the, the, the view that said we have to coordinate that, because, to your example, convener of a small convenience store wants to have a relatively simple, straightforward, consistent series of messages as we go through the process of working out what it's about and getting live. So we've stepped into that and are, are coordinating and organising and ensuring that there is a consistency of message, timing, media, to try and bring some um, simplicity to, to, to that. But those individual organisations do have very separate responsibilities. And for example, SEPA as the regulator um, are very clearly set, sitting there to ensure all parties um, adhere to the, the, the new obligations that they have. We work closely with them, but they also regulate us. So we have to keep some element of separation. Okay. I mean, I've been contacted myself, as you said, um, by the small convenience stores. Um, and one of the questions that they raised with me, which I actually got because I'm a former grocery stock controller myself, so um, was their, their, post, you know, their point of sale labels. Um, they were saying that they, they've still to, they're still trying to, fig to find out how they have got to have those labels. Um, you know, the shelf labels with the DRS on them, you know, they, were, they, they said, did I know if something costs a pound, do they have to have £1 plus 20p DRS, or is it, do they have to have £1.20, and uh, this is, includes the DRS? They're still trying to get confirmation from this. Now, I know the outside world will think that's a, a simple thing, but when you have got systems and programmes and everything behind, behind the scenes, they, they kind of need this information now so that they can be ready for the 16th of August. Can you give some clarity today? Um, 
Yes, um, there's a couple of ways of responding to that. Um, there are something like, I don't know, 35 different sections within regulations. So the impact, different people at different times. We pick up two of those. Um, they are important ones and they sit in the middle. But we have responsibilities to ensure we deliver the producer obligations to collect 90 per cent. Um, there are absolutely new obligations that are landing with retailers to ensure that consumers understand when they're in a shop that it's not a 20 pence increase in price, it's a 20 pence deposit which they get back. Um, those are obligations which the government has laid down on those organisations. Um, we don't have a role, we don't have any control or influence over the retail side of things. Um, those organisations are getting a lot of help from their trade associations. Um, SEPA have also provided some support, they have a very comprehensive website. But we don't have the ability to influence control what those shop operations do, because that's a new obligation which the government has said, retail, you have to comply with this. So between uh, the regulator, between the trade associations, those are probably the best sources of advice and support, because those organisations understand how a retail environment works. If you're not able to give that advice, then who can I say that they need to go to to, to, get that to to get that advice so that they can start getting their systems in place? We're uh, working with uh, a number of different trade associations across the convenience sector. They are very expert in understanding how the regulations affect the retail side of things. I would think they would be a, an excellent source of advice. Ultimately, SEPA are the regulator. They have a role to ensure their regulations are uh, made available and understood to everybody. They have an excellent website, which would be also a good source of, of advice. Not sure how... I'm slightly scratching my head on this in the sense that what is the advice? What, what are they supposed to do apart from consult with somebody else? The issue we have is that, Donald, correct me if I'm wrong, but trading standards and SEPA have not agreed on what the correct approach is. Oh, sorry, but hold on. You're running the scheme, so, you, you, so somebody rings your office as they've just been advised to do. Sorry, I don't mean to jump on your question, but somebody rings your office as they've been advised to do to get the information that, that they need to run the scheme. And the answer is, well, ring up SEPA or, or um, whoever else it was you suggested they do. That, that's not advice. That's passing the buck. I'm sorry, I'm confused. Help me, please. Well, we, we are not able to make that decision about what the correct approach is because it sits between trading standards and SEPA as the regulator to agree on what the correct approach is for shelf edge labelling and also the pricing labelling on multi-packs. So if we were to make a decision on this, we don't have the authority or the power to make that decision. I, I'm totally confused then how the scheme works if we don't know what we're doing at the outset. If, if I may, we want yeah. convener, you, you said we're running the scheme. It, it's, it's a so short statement, but to be pedantically clear, we are not running the entire deposit return scheme. We have a responsibility to deliver a large part of it on behalf of the producers who sit with the legal liability. The legislation passed by Scottish Government place additional obligations on the retail sector, for example, to act as a return point. That's not within our scope. That, that's not what we were set up to Sorry, deliver. If, uh, I'm going to come back to you, Jackie, but if I just ask a question. I went into a shop the other day, which will remain nameless, to buy 24 bottles, small bottles of water at £3. Each of those are going to be labelled, and it's going to come up a, a, an additional... It's 20p for each bottle, isn't it? So... Um, my maths would suggest that the, the deposit's going to be more than the water, and, and we don't know how that's going to be shown up uh, to the consumer who's being told it's not an increase in price. Um, sorry, I'm totally confused. And then I'm coming back to Jackie. I beg your pardon. May I make a comment? Yes, absolutely. Yes, for, for the vast majority of retailers, it's relatively straightforward. The regulations are quite clear. At the point of sale, make it clear to the consumer that there's a 20 pence deposit. So there's obvious that they're going to get that back. And that will be returned to them once they return the empty container. This is exactly how more than 50 other deposit return schemes around the world work. Hundreds of millions of consumers live and operate in, in that environment. It is absolutely a change to everybody in, in Scotland. There's no doubt about that. We've had a couple of um, different models of deposit returns, but very narrow, very operated. But this is a national-wide scheme. And it, it's... 
it, it, it sounds complicated. It's pretty straightforward. There are some technical issues absolutely to be resolved with regards to some of the, 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 the way that shelf edge labelling. I know some stores use digital mechanisms. The point about where the deposit sits with regards to the price on, for example, a price mark pack is a matter which has been discussed between SEPA, Scottish Government, and Trading Standards, and is close to resolution. Ship, if you want to. I'm confused um, because what you've just said would suggest to me that they should know how, what to put on the label, but they're telling me that they don't know what to put on the label just now. Do they have to have it separate or can they put it together? And uh, to me, that's just a simple question. Uh, and I agree that the, the exact point you've raised has been a simple question which has been asked of SEPA, the Scottish Government, trading standards organisations for some time. Um, it has been owned to res to, for resolution by Scottish Government. They are close to doing that. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that is not an ideal position. Government officials have been working very closely on it for some time. They are close to resolving that. I'm going to push you to go to the next question, yes, having, just, having identified a flaw in the yeah, system. Yeah, I was just going to go to the next question. Thank you, convener. Um, it's, another question that's been raised with me is the, the collections of containers from the small retail sites. Um, there is... So, and I mean the manual uplifts, not the, not the vending machine ones. Um, do you know, or is it in your gift to know, um, how often that, that is going to happen? And now I do realise that that depends on how many gets put back. But what's the criteria for, for the uplifts, if it's going to be a day or a week, uh, etc.? Because it all has an impact on the space that the local stores are going to have. Thank you, Ms Dunbar. I'm going to ask Simon, who's in charge of the logistics operation, to uh, answer that question for you. And so we recognise that collections are important and we want to create a meaningful schedule um, that matches people's requirements and is efficient and as cost effective as possible. So at the moment we're asking people to register so we understand what those schedules look like um, and we understand where we need to go to collect. Um, particularly for small stores, we, we recognise that there is a big issue in terms of space. Um, we are trying to ensure those guys have the ability when they register with us to put down their estimated number of returns and which will calculate a frequency of collection. Now, if they don't l agree with what that frequency suggests for them, they absolutely have the opportunity to put some free text in to say why that that's an issue and invariably it's going to be space. To which point uh, customer services will get in touch with those guys and Biffa will get in touch to create the schedule that suits the needs of those businesses. So we're absolutely trying to work with the small guys as well as the big guys to ensure that we create a collection schedule that suits their needs. Um, and if there are further issues, particularly for small guys, obviously they have the opportunity, if they're that small, to apply for an exemption. If they're in a rural location, that's obviously not ideal for them. Um, so we want them to get in touch. We'll go and visit them and we'll try and understand how we can help them to meet the needs of their shop and the needs of collections. In regard to the exemption, am I right in thinking that there's a distance um, that they can only get an exemption if they're so far away from a, a bigger retail um, store, which would have an impact on some? Is it 400 metres? There um, there's exemptions also for health and safety, fire safety and food safety. So, depending on the size of your store, if you're 100 metres squared or less, you can apply for an exemption on size. If you're 280 metres squared or less, you can apply for um, under, say, food to go or fire safety or health and safety. And I've been also been told that there's going to be an app for your mobile phones. Um, um, and so I was just going to ask uh, for the manual tape back for the containers just going to ask, do you know when that's going to be up and running and for, for the small retailers to be able to get a grasp of now? It's in final stages of development and testing uh, and should be available end of May, beginning of June for test, uh, and rolled out for people to be able to see what it does. Okay. Um, and another question, if I've got, if you don't mind, convener, is how do you, do you assess 
how well you're doing in, in being prepared for the for the August launch date. Um, you know, what's your, what's your level of confidence that you're going to be able um, to to go to go live? And do you think there's any milestones that you still need to to reach in order for this to happen? There's a great deal to do. We. we we did not set the timetable. We were given a timetable. And from the, from the point when that was set, we had to find the money to run the operation. We had to establish the partners, put the contracts in place to build the infrastructure. From that point on, we have been working around the clock to deliver for the 16th of August. We continue to do so. We have a path to being ready. There are many milestones, as you would imagine, in terms of delivering IT systems, delivering the, the, the various elements of that logistics infrastructure, but it's happening. There are counting centres being set up, machines being installed, vehicles are on the way. It's, it's actually happening in the physical world. We, what, one of the processes that we're constantly looking at is, is refining what is actually available on day one. The scheme will build up over time. Um, but in terms of how we manage and measure that, as you would expect, we've got a very significant project management team in place. Donald, would you like to talk more about how we actually manage the process? Certainly, yes. Um, it's a multi-work stream programme, as you'd expect. IT, operations, communications, commercial, uh, all those sort of things you'd expect. We have uh, a great team of project managers, programme managers. We have all the traditional tools you'd expect to see in terms of risk management, con contingency management. Our partners, who are obviously heavily responsible for large parts of delivery, have equally competent, strong teams. We have assurance over these in terms of them in terms of regular steering group meetings. Um, we have an integrated plan. You know, there's, there's nothing you wouldn't expect to see in terms of a, a large, complex delivery. There are risks ahead of us. We have plans in place to address those. As David said, we're confident we're going to be on the 16th of August ready to go. Okay. Um, do you want to go to well, there's a, there's a whole lot of supplementaries which you've obviously let, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, the cat out of the bag. But I'm going to come to the Deputy Convener for a question, then I'm going to go to Liam Kerr for a question. Yes, I, I just want to take you back to that very first question. Uh, Circularity Scotland, the name implies it's circular, it's end to end. But in your answers, you've said that uh, you're responsible only for the producers, and then you've uh, offloaded responsibility for retail responsibility to CEPA, the trade associations and the Scottish Government. Are you implying that there should have been a similar uh, organisation set up for the retailers, uh, similar to what uh, you currently do for the producers? Thank you, Deputy Convener. Um, no, I think it's important to clarify on that point. When we're talking about responsibility resting with CEPA, for example, trading standards, we're talking about a specific point in terms of the rules around labelling, which is very much outside our scope. Our responsibility, and if you look at the way we're, we, we are run 50-50. So half of our organisation is the return point side, which is retail and hospitality. Half of our organisation, the way they vote on any membership matters, 50% comes from producers. So that as part of discharging those responsibility for a producer, it is our responsibility to provide that service to the retailer. The retailer has an obligation to operate a return point. It's the producer's responsibility to service that return point and obviously to manage the interface with that retailer. It, the regulations place responsibilities on a retailer just as they do for a producer. If there are issues within that retailer's business, which they have obviously responsibility for, for meeting the obligations operating a return point, we cannot make the decisions for them but we are keen to support. We have a customer service team. We're keen, whether it's the largest retailer or the smallest convenience store, to be in a dialogue with them, and whether it be an issue with exemptions or with, with the, the service side and the collection side, the team are there to talk and support them so that there's that integration between us. Thank you, Convener. OK, uh, Liam, you had a question. Thank you, Convener. Morning, panel. Just very briefly arising from Jackie Dunbar's question there about your preparedness for 16th of August. What contingency planning are you doing uh, for the scheme if it isn't ready to go live on the 16th of August? Thank you, Mr Kerr. Um, we do not have... This, this timetable never gave us a great deal of time contingency. And at the time... 
When we were appointed a scheme administrator, at that point, the, de the deadline for the scheme was July 2022. Within the application to be scheme administrator, we made it clear we could not deliver that. Um, following that, we made representations to government around how we saw the scheme going live, and we, we identified that the period of September to October 2023 was deliverable, but it contained a degree of risk, and it did not allow for a great deal of contingency. That's the timetable that we are now working to. That risk has not gone away, and the contingency has not grown. In terms of what planning we are doing for contingency, right through the programme, we are looking at what alternatives can we put in. It is worth stressing, particularly looking at the operating side of this business, we are building an infrastructure to cope with returns at 90%. That will not be the case on day one. There will be a fairly extensive period where the, where the scheme ramps up, so that with the level of, of contingency that's built into the scale of that infrastructure, in addition to the lower, lower volumes at start-up, that to a degree does give us a, some cover. But also, the one thing, we can't buy extra days, but what you will see within the organisation is we are continuing continually applying more resource. So when we look at the IT side of this business, we keep, pulling, you know, we keep building up the resource so that we have effectively additional teams covering elements. But for us, we have an immovable object in terms of the date we need to hit, Donald. And if I may, one other additional point there, uh, turning it around slightly, Mr Kerr, when you have such an immovable deadline, another programme technique is to start looking at your scope. So unashamedly, there are things that we perhaps set out to say we're going to have these in place for go live. We've had a long, hard look at what we do and don't need, and there are some things we said, guess what, we don't really need this for go live. So to take the pressure off you know, a tight timeline, we've moved some things out. You know, for example, some, some of the reports that we might like to have for day one, let's bring them in shortly after go live, because there are more important critical things that we need to make sure we deliver right across the scheme. Thanks, Liam. Um, Mark, some questions from you, and then I'm going to go back to Jackie. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, should I take all my, all my questions no, at this point? Don't. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, maybe we could just sort of wind back a bit. I mean, it, there has been a lot of concern coming from certain businesses. Uh, I think you've addressed some of those. But what, what do you see as the outstanding concerns that, that still exist? Obviously, one, uh, th this, this is a massive and complex project. It touches thousands of businesses, and therefore there are legitimate concerns, and at no point do we, do we dis dispute that those concerns exist. Um, a lot of what we're seeing at the moment in terms of area of concern is coming from smaller producers. Um, we have 670 producers have appointed us to be their scheme administrator. 630 of those are small businesses. They are preparing, they've decided to use Circularity Scotland services to meet their obligations under the scheme. That does not mean that we are not listening to the other small producers that are out there, and all small businesses. Um, I am committed, personally, that this, this project that we are working on will not damage businesses, and therefore we will, we will continue to do everything we can to support them. What I'd like to do is ask Irene to talk more about what we're actually doing in practice to support those small businesses. To struggle with as a committee is to understand what are the, what are the real issues that have yet to be addressed compared to perhaps you know, issues around communication, for example, which you raised earlier on, or issues that have perhaps already been addressed but have not been communicated. So I'm really interested to know what, what are the issues that you're still working on. Please. So, yeah, so absolutely. So in terms of um, in our, in our uh, working with um, producers and retailers of all sizes, uh, one of the things we're doing at the moment is, uh, is running solution uh, working groups for the end invo invoicing process. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that we're very uh, supportive of and we are collaborating with the large and small retailers, wholesalers and producers of large and small size too to make sure that across that supply chain there is a commonality and an understanding of how the invoicing, the, the, when items are placed on market, when they go into a depot, when, when VAT is applied, when VAT is not applied. And, you know, I would say um, that this is a, an example of how it's not exactly within our remit to, to do this, but it's absolutely of everybody's interest, and we're very happy to facilitate that. So I would say that clarity across the supply chain of the different stages of invoicing is one area that, that we've identified along with uh, many of our members, and um, we're working through that with them at the moment. 
So that, that's one area. Yeah. Are, there, are there other areas? Well, in the first instance is particularly our Irene's leading workshops with those concerned businesses to make sure that we fully understand their issues. Um, one of the big issues raised particularly by small businesses was the cash flow impact of the scheme going live. We put measures in place designed to address that, which we believe do. But there are still concerns coming from small... Invoicing is one of them. There's a general level of readiness. Many small businesses don't have a great deal of resource to necessarily be ready for the 16th. Obviously, that's an area which has had a lot of discussion politically recently. And we are, we are keen to do anything we can... And we're still looking at measures that can address some of those concerns. But also, I think the, the compliance approach that CEPA have put in place which effectively looks, if a, if, a, if a small business is not ready, what are they doing? And are, is their position reasonable? Um, if I look more broadly at the scheme, this is a cost to producers. And therefore, there are concerns about what it will cost them and knowledge and visibility and understanding of that cost. And in many ways, it, to an extent, it could come back to the governance point that you raised earlier. And we were set up as an... Our constitution sets out a number of things. One is that all... All businesses are treated the same. Being a member doesn't give you a privilege. You get, everybody gets the same deal. Everybody gets the benefit of the level of investment that's being made behind Circularity Scotland. And therefore, when we look at the cost of the scheme, ultimately, it is a feature of the regulations that have been passed that the cost of running this goes back to the, to the producer. But our remit and our commitment is to be cost-effective in doing so. And that's why we have to sit in the point of conflict between the retailers who want a higher fee, the fee which is the greatest cost to producers, and we have to manage that conflict, which puts us in a, in a pressure point situation because we're trying to find a compromise. And a lot of the talk with producers around the registration point obviously has been about understanding what liability they're signing up for. Their liability is for one, two and a half to three billionth of the cost of running the scheme for every container they put on the market. That is the extent of it. But obviously, today, we are working with forecast costs. We made a forecast last August. That was a relatively high producer fee. We've been able to redesign the scheme subsequently and indicate up to 40% reduction in that producer fee. But we recognise it's still a forecast because we will only know what those costs are at the point that we go live. However, that reduction demonstrates a confidence in the abilities of, of the whole of industry, because we can't manage all of this ourselves, but us in the middle and industry to manage those costs efficiently. And furthermore, if we look at the, the actual cost of putting the scheme in place, we sit here today, our costs are below budget. If we judge ourselves by the results we're delivering, we are managing our costs effectively and working tirelessly, particularly Simon's and Irene's teams, on making sure that the infrastructure we build is able to operate efficiently and then grow in efficiency as it goes live. But that, I'm afraid, that the concerned producers have about the cost coming from this. They can, they can place trust in us to manage it, but the fact that the cost of operating a deposit return scheme, it becomes a cost of doing business if you're a producer of drinks. And that is, is probably one of the more significant areas that many producers remain concerned about. OK, um, can I just focus on a couple of other specific areas then as well? Um, I'd like to understand what, what the challenges might be with this cutover period. So this is where you have, you know, scheme items, non-scheme items still in circulation. Um, and, and perhaps if you could offer some thoughts on how that might work with a, a grace period for small producers as well. Um, because it, it feels that, that there would be a complexity there in terms of having items that are either in or out of the scheme. I'll pass that to Donald, who's, who's been the one very much involved in the and cut over has been a challenge this scheme has faced since the beginning. Um, I'm going to ask Donald to talk in more detail about cut over. On the grace period for small producers, we really want to help small businesses with the transition to a deposit return scheme operating. Um, there are many, everything you do in deposit return has unforeseen and potentially unpredictable adverse consequences. And we have to be very careful that small producers who may be relieved at having a grace period do not find that they are commercially disadvantaged. If you are a small producer supplying a big retailer, 
that big retailer has a lot of power and wants things to be very simple. And you know, I've flagged this when I'm speaking to small producers that I think they have to be very careful what they wish for with some of, with some of these elements that they don't find. Yeah, they may be pleased they're not having to address the deposit return quickly, but they may find the business from a sales point of view is being disadvantaged. But in terms of actually how cutover will work, I'm going to ask Donald to talk some more about that, please. Certainly. Um, when we ran the roadshows in the conference, uh, I was the uh, lucky person to talk about cutover. I'll refer you to my YouTube channel where the full presentation is there. So it's a long, complicated process. I'm not going to go into the real detail of it. In, a sense, in essence, cutover is the process of moving producers, retailers, everybody involved in the supply chain from the current way of operating in Scotland to a world where deposit return scheme is fully embedded, where consumers are fully aware of um, purchasing items with 20 pence. Um, one of the unique elements of the scheme in Scotland is that we will have types of containers which will be sold just in Scotland, but we will also continue to have containers which continue to be sold across the UK. And that absolutely presents challenges. We're not shying away from that. So one of the challenges of cutover is to help producers, retailers and consumers understand there is a transition. Um, there will be some products which, as they are ramped down and flushed through the supply chain, won't attract a deposit. And there will be new products coming through, which are the deposit-bearing products, which must be identified separately. The legislation has been reasonably well designed to try and accommodate that, so um, consumers can expect to see maybe part of the shelf which says, and retailers have an obligation to do this, these items are not in the scheme, they're gradually being sold through. That will take a bit of time, two or three weeks, depending on the nature of the, the, the turnover of those goods. Um, we absolutely understand there is a strong requirement to support consumers in particular during that phase. Um, and we're, we've already started to design what that campaign looks like in conjunction with retailers and producers. And we'll manage that process very carefully, uh, get to the other side. The reason we have the ability to have both UK-wide and Scottish-specific is, again, in support of smaller producers, because there are costs associated with changing our labels, changing our whole supply chain. And that was recognised right from day one when, when, when the policy officers were thinking about that. We'll deal with it. It's something a little bit different for Scotland. Um, other schemes have, have, have danced around it, if you like, but we've spent a lot of time working right across the industry to, to have a plan. We've published a guidance on that to manage it closely um, and help consumers get to the, the, the DRS operation once we're past that. So that, that's a transitionary period then, as you said, that, that's you know, part of the course with many other DRS schemes. But if there, was a, if there was a grace period for small producers in the middle of that, I'm just trying to think what, what kind of complexity that would cause. I mean, if you had a convenience store, for example, that was selling whiskey and you had small, you know, small distilleries that are not in the scheme and distilleries that are, up, that are in the scheme, you would have quite a complex shelf of regional whiskies, some in, some out. I, I just, yeah. I, how, how does that, that work? I mean, I appreciate your, your point, Mr. Harris, that the larger retailers might just go forget this. It's, it's too much. But it, it, what, what other issues might there be with that, with that grace period for small producers, for those that are retailing and wholesale? I, I, think, I think we've touched on some of those. It, it, it cut over is a temporary period, and we know there's going to be some... Um, different ways of treating stock, but it's for a defined period. In some ways, um, and clearly more design work needs to be done if that's the direction that the government decides to go, um, a, a, a grace period for smaller producers could be seen to say, actually, your products are going to be, continue to be outside the scheme. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, in all that is bringing consumers along with that. Um, one of the fundamental policy objectives is to change consumer behaviour just as the behaviour of hundreds of millions of other consumers uh, across, across the world have done so, to get in the habit of saying, I pay 20p, I bring my empty container back, I get my deposit back. Clearly, if some containers, some products are outside the scheme, there's a different message, and we're going to have to be really careful that we support consumers in that process. And, as, as, as David has said, also make sure that there are no unintended consequences as far as those small producers are concerned, because um, retail is a very slick, streamlined, automated process. It doesn't like things which are a bit different. Um, so that's obviously a choice for the retailers to decide what to do, but they would rather have consistency. 
which certainly supports the consumer side of things. So it's a challenge. Uh, if that's the direction that we end up going in, then we will work with industry to figure out a way to, to make sure we, we, we manage that as best we all collectively can. Hmm. Um, I've got one more question. It's just about the, um, the map of return points, um, which I know is very, <laughs> very, very specific. Uh, aspect of the scheme, but obviously important, particularly for people in rural areas. So when, at, what, at what point we have certainty as to, as to what that map looks like? I think you've talked already in response to Jackie Dunbar's question about the, the kind of collection schedules, which will be, again, hugely important for small rural stores that maybe don't have the capacity to store. But, uh, but in terms of that, that map of where people expect to, to be able to take back their cans and bottles, when, when would that come? Thank you. What we will see is a growing network. I do not expect there to be all potential return points up and running and functioning as return points on the 16th of August. What I expect to see is an adequate network so that we as consumers can interact with the scheme effectively and many stores will either be simply operating a manual point while they assess the situation or coming on stream as we go live. What we're concerned primarily with is making sure there is enough so that uh, the consumer is able to access the scheme. It's, it's vital that, that all of us who are paying out those 20p's that we talked about are able to, within our local area, without being inconvenienced to affect return. Simon, would you, would you talk a little bit more about the mapping and the work that's being done to actually build the network? Yeah, so in terms of, obviously we require people to register. So we have a list of retailers from small to large. Um, <clears throat> did you, from a mapping perspective, whether you go for three retailers or nine, the nine major retailers before we get to the convenience guys, the spread is pretty much covered geographically and the small independents, particularly in rural areas, enhance that ability for people to return. Um, as you would expect, the central belt is very condensed um, with retailers and that causes us a logistical problem in terms of number of collections. And in that aspect, we would look for exemptions to be taken, but certainly for when, you, when you, you map out the large retailers and then you add in the small ones, you get a, a, a good geographic spread across Scotland. There will always be places that someone lives that doesn't have a store. But um, in those instances, we need to look at how we can support those communities at some point in the future. Okay. Point very, quick, very quickly, we have the benefit of learning a lot from more than 50 other schemes that have already gone live. One of the more recent ones that went live, I think, was Slovakia, and I always get it confused with Slovenia, but they went live 1st of January last year. Even now, they are still adding to their return point network as uh, retailers decide, yes, do you know what, I want to be part of this, or indeed actually realise there is a scheme in place. So it is an ever-evolving process. Our registration capability will stay open permanently. Right, in terms of the... Unless, of course, they decide to apply for an exemption and, and may decide, do you know what, um, I recognise I do qualify for an exemption or perhaps the return rate that uh, they were expecting doesn't actually come to pass. There's a lot of unknowns here and we won't really know collectively until the scheme is live and really understand the dynamics of where containers actually come back. Right. Let's make it Thanks, Mark. Um, Jackie, I think you wanted a quick question here. Yeah, it was just um, in regards to your speaking about the processes. Some of them are complicated and some of them aren't. Um, I was just wanting to ask um, what support you've asked for from Scottish Government and, and other agencies um, to try and help you get through these processes. The main area, we, we're obviously in constant dialogue with governments about the operation of the scheme as well as the regulator. And... The, the word pragmatism has been used a great deal. And I think what's been issued by CEPA in the last few weeks about their approach to how they will regulate the scheme as it comes into being. The, the main area is to make sure that wherever possible, even at this stage, if we're able to simplify the regulations, make it more, make it more deliverable for industry. Um, in many respects, if we can use common sense interpreting the regulations within that um, enforcement framework that CEPA have issued to make sure that, we're, that as a business you're able to make common sense decisions about what works for you, what is the right. Small retailers in particular understand their market, they understand their locality, they understand what is the right thing to do. We're keen as much as we can to be able to work with them, to put in place so that we, we can collect if they're operating a return point 
to, in a way that works for them so they can give the service they want to give. If it's not the right thing for them to be a return point, we're keen to support them. And that's why we welcomed the change on the exemptions. In terms of the practicalities, we're, we're, we're here working for industry. We're, you know, industry are paying for this, so we're very much mobilising the resources across organisations like BIFA, RLG and PwC who are building IT systems to make sure that we've got all of the capability that we can harness. I think we're in three continents in terms of the IT build to make sure that we're, we're, we're throwing all the right resources at that, but very much working with government. And I, you know, I'm happy to, to talk in those terms today. The more common sense we can use in terms of interpreting, implementing these regulations, let, if we let business people make the right decisions for, the, for their business, back to the point about having an adequate return network, the market will decide this for us. Those stores know. And if, if, they, if, if they need to, many in rural areas in particular, they're there to provide a service. They'll understand what they need. We just want to support them with a service that enables them to do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, next question is from Liam Kerr. Liam. Convener, and good morning again, panel. Uh, first of all, David, is, uh, are Circularity Scotland concerned that following the passing of the original deadline for registration, that there will be a significant number of smaller producers currently marketing products in Scotland who still haven't registered, and if they don't by the launch date, the 16th of August, will they still be able to sell in Scotland? This is where I think that the updated guidance from SEPA is very important, because what SEPA are saying, if they turn up to, if you've got a small distillery with a shop and you sell all of your products in that shop, and if on day one of the scheme of the 16th of August you are not operating a deposit return scheme, What's the plan? Are you committed to becoming compliant with the scheme? And what is your plan for doing so? And I think what is difficult for a small business, the businesses we are dealing with are not used to being regulated by SEPA. If you've been regulated by SEPA for the last 20 years, you can read these documents and understand them better. So I think there is a, technically, you have to be registered with a scheme administrator or directly with SEPA on the 16th of August to sell in Scotland. What has been set out is a document which you can interpret, and I use the word carefully interpret, that because it's giving guidance, it's giving guidance about having a plan in place. Donald? Yeah, I mean, if I may simply say, and I said I wouldn't speak on behalf of the regulator, um, SEPA are very aware that a lot of organisations they are now about to deal with have never dealt with them before. So just recently, SEPA published a, a guidance to how they would support, regulate and ultimately enforce. And as David said, the pragmatic view they are taking, and we are again speaking on their behalf, you may wish to have them directly in front of you at some point, have said, if you are committed to complying, but you're struggling for whatever reason, SEPA will support them. We've interpreted that as you have to aim for compliance with regards to the dates, if there are genuine reasons why you haven't been able to do so, SEPA will continue to support them so they can get compliant. We will maintain open our registration window um, for as long as it takes. So there may be genuine reasons why a company which has not been able to register in time, it is not, as far as my interpretation is concerned, a shutter. If there's requirements that need to be supported by SEPA, that organisation can be helped by SEPA to get through and register and continue to trade. Nobody wants to close down trade for those organisations. Thank you, but go on, Liam. Could you just clarify that for me, just so I understand it, because I'm slightly confused here. SEPA have got regulations which have been enforced and put in by the Parliament. And what you're saying is SEPA don't have to abide by those regulations. They can interpret them as they see fit if they think they're moving in the general direction. That's not my understanding of the law, but if, that, if that's what you're saying, I'd be interested to hear that just repeated. No, uh, with, with respect, Convener, no, that's what, not what I said. Um, the laws are laid down by the Parliament. SEPA regulate against those. SEPA have an approach to regulation which is not um, black and white. They have a desire, like a lot of regulators, to support organisations in becoming compliant with the regulations. And believe you me, SEPA are very clear, they will absolutely go to the letter of the regulations. But they have a role, a pragmatic role, to support and help organisations get to compliance. This is a change 
for these, these businesses. And they, they need time to adjust to that. And SEPA are taking a view, a pragmatic view, that says if you have an intent to comply with the regulations, but for whatever legitimate reason you're struggling, SEPA will support them. Clearly, if you're a business which says, I'm going to ignore those, I'm going to find ways around them, you'll have a very different conversation with your regulator. So to be really clear, they're interpreting the regulations as laid down and approved by the good people here, um, but they are supporting businesses to get to a position of compliance, which is what everybody wants. Thank you for clarifying. Sorry to tread on your toes, Liam. So to be absolutely clear, I've got to ask you another question in a second, but just to reflect back what you've said, if my business, if I had one, was not registered by the 16th of August, I may not be able to sell in Scotland going forward. The question, uh, so if you could answer that w when you take the next question, uh, Mark Ruskell asked uh, some interesting questions earlier about the support package that uh, the measures that have been put in place uh, to help smaller producers participate in DRS. Uh, notwithstanding those support measures, will there nevertheless be small, perhaps artisan businesses who you project will go out of business due to this scheme, uh, perhaps uh, due to the obligations placed on them uh, as detailed by the Deputy Convener earlier? Firstly, in terms of compliance on the 16th of August, as the regulations stand, you must be registered with a, either SEPA or a scheme administrator on the 16th of August to sell in Scotland. What Donald obviously has described is there's a, within the way these regulations are being enforced, there's some scope for supporting businesses who are not fully compliant on the 16th of August to become so. As an organisation, what we're committed, we've been, we have the opportunity to continue to register these businesses, is to work with them to address what concerns them about being able to, being able to register and operate deposit return, which links into the question about whether they will still be here due to the complexity of bringing the scheme to life. Um, we, and I'm going to ask Irene, because we've spe we're spending time with the organisations representing small businesses to understand what issues have not been addressed that we can fix and find solutions for. And it's, it's very much for us about being practical, finding the problems and seeking to address them. Irene, could you? Thank you, David. I, I would like to say at the absolute outset, it's our intention that no businesses you know, would, would, would suffer you know, financial harm through this. As David said, there is absolutely a cost to the scheme. Uh, with all producers uh, contributing to that because it's a change in how we're recycling materials. But, you know, the whole board and the, all of the exec team within Circularity Scotland, uh, you know, it's our objective to support all businesses through this. And as a result of that, what we've been working on are solution-based workshops with the associations that represent these smaller producers. And, um, and this, you know, this is, the dialogue's been going on for some time, but we've, we've increased the intensity of our our um, discussions with them and coming up with the absolute solutions that are required. So I could give an example, which is something we're exploring. It's not, it's not committed yet. But an example would be, um, you know, is there a threshold of, of smaller volumes uh, for um, wine importers, for example, that would be pragmatic, common sense, and something that we could look at for, for a short period of time. So we are absolutely committed to coming forward and working with these organisations to get solutions that are going to help them navigate their way through this change. And that as a result of that, you know, the ideal is there, there are no businesses that are adversely affected by, by this implementation. I'll come back later. Okay, thanks, Liam. Um, I'm going to come to Colette Stevenson now. Colette. Okay, thanks, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, yeah, I've got several questions, and I was invited along to a small distillery in my constituency recently who have got a variety of concerns. Um, they produce uh, predominantly whisky and gin, and um, they have, they've attended the roadshow. Um, they, didn't feel, they felt they were more um, confused by the roadshow, and a lot of their answers, um, uh, sorry, questions weren't answered. So touching upon some of the things um, you spoke about, their, their bottles are very exquisite. Um, they're all wrapped. They're absolutely beautiful. In fact, when I visited 
One of them was actually in terms of touching upon cir circular economy and single use. It was getting used as a lampshade and a candle holder. So their big concern in terms of incurring costs is that as a producer and a small producer is that they would be incurring that cost for each bottle. However, the likelihood is these items will not be brought back in. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, what they do do in terms of some of their um, suppliers is they actually um, just fill the bottle back up rather than actually um, you know, recycle it. And the other thing um, that, I w that they pointed out was because the bottle is so beautiful, more often than not, the likelihood is that wouldn't be a litter item on our streets. So, again, um, maybe you could actually touch upon that as well. And I would take up your offer of to go and visit them and answer some of the questions. Because the, the other areas that they asked about was the import label. They've consulted with HMRC, who have said that it's actually um, a fraud aspect of it in terms of the import label. And the other I, um, aspect is because they're bottles wrapped, what about the relabeling again? Can you come up with solutions there? Uh, I'd be keen to know what your comments are on that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think what you just outlined there is, is a compelling case for where you have tiny volumes that we potentially seek a route to, to get them exempted, which is something that we're, we're keen to explore. Um, but notwithstanding that, which we, that doesn't exist today. What are we doing today? Primarily, is looking at this, effectively a sticky labelling solution to provide a low admin practical option for low volume producers. And we're talking about produ producers items below twenty five thousand units a year. So it's not in the handmade category. It's a much higher volume. Simon, could you touch on that, please? Yeah. yeah so, to enable small producers who don't invest in labels or don't bark, so a lot of them don't barcode their particularly the small whiskey and gin guys, and people don't actually want a barcode on the bottle either, particularly if it's an attractive bottle. So we're in the process of finalising the solution that will allow um, a producer to order a GS1 compliant barcode. Uh, we'll provide them with labels which they can provide to the consumer with the bottle. Should the consumer wa wish to take their 20p back, they have the ability to apply the label and take it to a machine or a manual return point to get their money back. And if they choose not to because they want to turn it into a lampshade and they don't want to take the extra sticker off, then, then, then that is their prerogative. But we absolutely want to make sure that you know, the, the small producers don't have to invest in uh, heavy labelling and kind of change the dynamic of their bottle. We want to give them a simple solution that allows them to be able to offer the consumer their 20p back. Two other questions you had in there very quickly. Um, in terms of um, consumers keeping the bottles, in appointing a scheme administrator, the responsibility to achieve 90% passes collectively over to the scheme administrator in totality, so that your, your distillery wouldn't have to worry about specifically having 90% return rate. That would be taken care of by us. Um, and the point about refillables, if the company is marketing them as a refillable product, which is a very environmentally friendly approach, then they are out of scope of the scheme and they wouldn't, wouldn't need to take part. Okay, um, as far as I'm aware, they've been told that they do need to take part in well, the, 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 you know, they, compliance. They can consult with SEPA, who are the ultimate determinant of whether they're in scope or not, but um, they have options there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I wanted to ask about was about um, how you've gone about setting um, your fee structure for producers as well. Um, did you look at aspects such as how costs would be like, distributed across businesses or the environmental impacts of different materials? And are the producers still raising concerns about the free structure following the changes made in the support package as well? Thank you. Um, in terms of the dialogue that we're having with producers, we've had obviously we had a lot of adverse feedback back in August when we went out with the original fees that were quite high. Uh, reflecting a set of estimates at the time. When we were able to revise this in November, the feedback we've had pretty much across industry is that, of course, they'd rather it be less,
but we're now at a level that they feel is realistic and reasonable. And the message we have given clearly is the one about commitment to developing the efficiency of this so that we, you know, I would like to see the fees come down over time as we're more efficient. Obviously, in an inflationary world, that is something of a challenge. But be clear, there is an absolute commitment there to keep improving it. But also, what we've done at this stage, again, taking feedback that came from industry, but we've, we've looked at reflecting the different operating costs for the different materials. Glass is more expensive to handle. We don't have a choice about whether glass is in the scheme. The regulations require it. We have to collect it. But it costs more to handle. That's reflected in the fee. We've reflected the different differential costs uh, of operating with the different materials. But we have also reflected the different values of material. Aluminium cans, when they're bailed, are extremely valuable. Glass is not. And that's one of the other features of the fees. The other point I'd stress on this is that the way we are set up is that we effectively have a fee structure that's flat on a per container basis. And if we ignore any fixed costs that might be within the producer for systems or anything that they need to do within their company, I feel that one of the benefits we have here, we're open access. You don't have to be a member to sign up with us. You do not have to be a major producer who can provide funding to sign up with us. We are completely self-funded. So whether you are the smallest company or the largest drinks company in the world, you're paying the same price. The big guy is not getting or is sharing their buying power with everybody across the spectrum. Um, that, and beyond where we are today, we will, right now we're relying on a lot of estimates and assumptions about what will actually happen when this goes live. How will the cost build up? What containers will actually be placed on the market? Will there be changes? in the nature of containers placed on the market as a result of the scheme. Very quickly when we go live, we become very data rich. That will enable us to assess the drivers of costs, assess whether we still have the most appropriate fee structure and we have the scope to evolve it. Very much with the eye to it being based on the cost drivers, but also fair, so that producers are paying a fair fee for their share of the costs that are created. Okay, thank you. Just last question. Last one, and then I'm <laughs> going to come to Monica. There has been um, various different reports, like in in the media, and the, you know, uh, and whatnot, and social media, and things about, um, and uh, you know, from Scotland and and, and then you know, cross border, and potential fraud to be carried out. Um, what have you done to prepare for that, and and to what extent do you think it will all occur, or how how big it will occur? You. A function of this fee scheme is that we are implementing it in Scotland, which has an open border with England, and we, are not, we do not have the power to compel producers to label and differentiate Scottish market products. We expect a great many of the products placed on the market in Scotland to be treated so. We wish we could. We wish if, we could, if I could change one thing today, we'd have the power to enforce those labels. But we don't. It's, it's the nature of the world we're living in. But as you would expect, a great deal is being done, which I'll ask Irene to talk about, in terms of addressing and managing the risk. We can't eliminate it. But what are we doing to manage it? Thank you. Just pause that there, because I think that's going to be delved into slightly later uh, in, in, in the session um, and try not to uh, tread on anyone's toes. But I'm going to come to, <laughs> come to Monica, if I may, please. Thank you, Kudvina, and good morning, panel. It's been quite an interesting session so far, and I'll probably pick up on Killett Stevenson's questions about small producers, because that's where my, my interest is today. But at the start, I was quite struck by your comment that we have um, you know, more than 100 years of relevant experience in front of us today. So on the one hand, that's, that's reassuring, um, but we can see that there's many small producers still not getting access to the, the answers they need. So I'm hoping today that we, we can make some progress on that. Um, sticking with small producers, I think Killett and I have been speaking to the, the same local businesses, um, but they're not alone. Um, the example I have in mind 
is a small producer um, who didn't sign up before the deadline. They haven't signed up yet. And they did attend one of your in-person roadshows, but they have left there very frustrated. Speaking to other small producers, they have these common concerns. And I think all of us want a more circular economy, but we don't want people going round and round in circles trying to get very basic answers and being passed between Circularity Scotland, SEPA, We've heard about trading standards and, of course, the minister in this business said that the minister didn't reply to them. But what I think I heard David Harris say a moment ago is that the example that Colette Stevenson um, described, they might actually be exempt um, because they do operate on such a small scale at the moment. And they are trying to heavily promote um, refill and reuse. Um, so if they are exempt, who would tell them that and why have they not been able to get that information so far from Circularity Scotland or from SEPA or from the government? There is no exemption for them. But what we've indicated is one of, through the workshops we've been holding with small producer representatives, one of the requests that's come forward, which we're supportive of, would be just mm. that. Um, we can't repeat enough if you're speaking to small producers or any, small, any business that's got concerns, please get them to call us because we're having a huge amount, and we're getting it fed back to us constantly, particularly through the website, misinformation and, and poor interpretation of either our role or the regulations. And if somebody engages with us to support them, we're not seeking to pass them off to SEPA or send them away to read the regulations. We've got a customer service team who've now been doing this probably for six months and built a huge amount of knowledge supporting the hundreds of small businesses that have signed up or still talking to, this, to us. Obviously, it concerns me if they've attended workshops and left concerned that they haven't got the answers because, because we're committed to addressing that. So the first thing is to make sure that people... Go on. And thank you to your customer service team. They clearly have a, a busy and, and, and challenging job to do. Um, these small businesses that we're talking about today, they're heavily invested in local communities, heavily invested in their workforces and securing people's jobs and growing their businesses, um, thinking also about net zero and sustainability. Um, they're not shy at picking up the phone. They're not shy at emailing <laughs> MSPs and asking people to come out. So I just wonder how many times do they have to phone and ask the question before they get the answer? And is it right to pass them to SEPA? And is there an opportunity to actually get SEPA, Circularity Scotland and others that can answer in the same room? Because that seems to be the problem that people are getting passed from pillar to post. For the first point on this, if that is the situation, yes. please don't put them in touch with customer service. Put them in touch with me so that I can get to the bottom of what the situation is. Um, we have, and this is a big change. A lot of these businesses have never been regulated. As you talk about, that the, these are businesses that are committed to their community. Many of these small businesses, they're already there in terms of being green and meeting their responsibilities. The regulations have come along and they're caught. It's not, our, it's not our, us that's caught them with the regulations, but we're the one organisation that's been created to provide an answer to this. Um, we have... Well, all I would say is if you've got a situation where people have spoken to us and they're not happy and they're approaching you, please contact me directly because I want to speak to them and get to the bottom of what the issue is and make sure... You know, we, we've grown this company from nobody to 50 people in six months. So if there's, if there's something that's not working there... I want to know about it so that we can fix it. I wondered in terms of, and it's a very genuine offer I'm sure that you've made, but as Chief Executive, um, and you've got a lot of operational um, stuff to roll out from what, what you've said, um, you know, is that a good way to do business that every single problem and query has to be channeled to you to, to get a, an answer? I'm, I'm not saying that to be... Um, you know, um, cheeky in any way, but it's just about, you know, if, if that's where we're at right now, and we've gone beyond that original sign-up date, um, are, are you feeding this back to, to ministers? Are you discussing this with the, the minister, Lorna Slater? Because you've picked up that 
you think maybe there should be a case for exemption. You're correct, it's not in the regulation right now, but are you feeding that back to government? We are, we are constantly in dialogue with government about the evolution of the scheme. Donald talked earlier about managing the scope of the scheme. As you'd expect, anything that we can do to make this more manageable or more, more implementable, we are in dialogue with, with, with. We're not just talking to the producer, we're talking to everybody who can have a say in sorting this. Um, but as I say, we, we started this business from nothing and we've had to build it very quickly. One of the things I've found many times is I've had reports that people can't speak to us without answering questions. We have a CRM system. I can go back, I can check what discussions have taken place. We've had a lot of incidents where a huge amount of time has been spent. Obviously, I'm not suggesting this is the business you're talking to, but answers have been, but people may not like the answers. A lot of this, you know, if people don't want to operate a deposit return scheme, we can't make it go away. Um, and therefore, we have spoken to people. They've not been happy with where they've got to. They've written, they've written to their MSP or their MP who's contacted us. So we need to know. We've got a great team of people there, all learning fast in a new business. And only by knowing where there is a deficiency will we actually be able to go and fix it, which is why I do urge if there's a problem that it gets reported to me so that I can talk to the team and actually deal with that incident. Because every time I get a letter from an MSP talking about a business, the first thing I do is go to customer service and say, right, have these people spoken to us? What have we discussed? Where was it left? To try and make sure that we are, we are, we are closing down problems as they arise. What are you doing to be more open and transparent? Because this is about confidence and trust and people being able to get information and get that clarity. I know Donald mentioned a YouTube video. Um, I'm sure there's lots of resources out there, but when you're capturing these inquiries, are you put, you might have done it already, but is this all on your website? You know, is this information being shared so that people don't have to keep you know, coming to you with bespoke inquiries? Donald, do you want to pick up on the comments point? A couple of things in there. Um, absolutely, like any organisation responding to queries, as we see regular types of queries, we update our website. Um, some of the queries are related to the legislation. SIPA update their website. Um, as I said before, we're organising and collaborating and trying to coordinate all the various communications that happen to ensure that there is a growing body of um, support and evidence. We are producing guidance documents, documents more and more frequently. I think another two or three have gone live in the last few days. There is a group which we haven't mentioned yet, which again is in relation to the gateway reviews, because some of the questions that are asked of our team, we, we genuinely do not have the answers. We do not know what is the detailed approach for how VAT will be in the real detail addressed. But we're working very closely with Scottish Government, who are on point to address that. So there is an organisation, a group set up by government, chaired by government, with representatives of retails, producers, ourselves, SEPA, Zeoway Scotland, the, the system-wide assurance group. And it is the body which ensures that all the hard problems and questions, many of which sit outside our, our remit and scope, are logged and dealt with. Some of those sit with government to address, some sit with SEPA, some sit with Zeeway Scotland, but there are representatives of all the organisations affected by DRS on that group. So that's another forum which is set up and chaired by government in recognition that yes, there are a lot of different moving parts here. Not all of them sit with ourselves, not all sit with SEPA, for example. So government has put itself in the middle of that and is using that as a forum to also support uh, the resolution of the, these, these questions. Okay. And briefly. Yeah, very briefly. Just to return to the point about um, you know these beautiful bottles that you know can be reused for lamps and candles and so on. Um, I think we both spoke to the same business and they're concerned that the, the, the bottle has to be returned for recycling. It has to be smashed. Um, now that you have a bit more knowledge of this and also the Parliament will be looking at a circular economy bill. Do you think there needs to be more flexibility around that type of situation that we've described today? Absolutely, if I could answer that question. Um, we are collaborating and working really closely with um, SEPA, um, the Scottish Government and the organisations that represent these small, um, these small businesses. And, um, and we're coming up with solutions to the, the specific issues that they're raising. And working out uh, how we can bring that, those solutions to life within the current legislation, perhaps over a phased period, um, and 
you know, we've, I would also like to say that small producers have been, you know, since my time in the business um, of, of Circularity Scotland, have been, you know, a real priority, and we've dedicated an enormous amount of resource to working on uh, the, the the answers that that they're looking for, um, and and but it's 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 working with governments uh, because. If, if the legislation is, is as it is, then we need to onboard these small producers. If there are specifics that your, your um, uh, constituent is saying, then that is, a, that is an area that we can investigate and come up with a pragmatic solution and then take that to government as a, as a, as a suggestion from the, the trade bodies, from CEPA, from Circularity Scotland and from government. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, now, I'm getting some dirty looks from, from some people around the table who want to ask more questions. I just want to uh, reiterate that I'm going to run this on a wee bit so that the members who've come to this committee are not part of it can ask their questions. So don't worry about it. You, you'll get in in due course. Just before I move on to Liam with his next questions, I want to ask a question. Uh, see if I can, David, be of help to you. You talked about an exemption scheme and uh, the ability to exempt. Uh, businesses, small businesses. Would it be helpful to tell us when you think those guidelines need to be in place to make it work? Oh, Next it, month, this month? Time is not on our side and therefore everything that we can do, which, as you probably gather from, we're working at incredible pace here, having, throwing a lot of resource at really trying to get to the bottom of what can be done to address the concerns of these small businesses. We've been through a month where the level of political uncertainty has made life difficult because a lot of industries have seen, seen the, the narrative that's out there and slowed down, but we've kept pushing hard and not sat back on this. But as we go through with obviously various you know, narrative that's out there about things being done for small producers, the sooner decisions are made and we can deal with certainty and plan accordingly, the better. Very simple terms. I'm sure whoever uh, needs to be watching this committee meeting will be watching it. You need the answer now, is, is, is what you're saying. OK, Liam, yours is the next question. Thank you, convener. I'd like to go back to something that Jackie Dunbar asked about earlier, which is collections and space. Uh, first of all, what do you advise smaller retailers or rural retailers to do if, let's say, they have particularly large deposits come back, uh, or let's say there's a local event and their uh, space is overfilled. What is the contingency plan if the uplift that is needed is more uh, regular than their usual collection schedule? What should they do? Thank you. Simon, could you? Yeah. So we do have an uh, opportunity for on-demand. So uh, contact us and we will arrange an on-demand collection. Um, if they know about the event, then get in touch in advance. So we're already working with, for example, the guys that organise the Fringe to ensure that uh, there is a suitable collection process available for the Fringe Festival in August. So the more notice they can give us of any events, then the, the more we're able to plan and come up with a solution for them. So it might be that we can get a mobile RVM in place for that event, for example. So we will absolutely aim to work with them to support that. And in terms of if there is more than expected, or if someone turns up with a vanful to a rural community, under the legislation, they technically can say no. Uh, that's too much. It's not within our scope to, to take that much back. So I appreciate that. That might be difficult, but they do have that right. Now, obviously, we'll do everything we can to support them in collections, be that ad hoc, or making sure the frequency is, is sufficient for them, because we also understand in certain rural areas th there's going to be an element of seasonality. Thank you for that. And uh, perhaps in my next question, you could just answer, will there be or confirm there wouldn't be an extra cost uh, to the retailer for any ad hoc uh, pickup? Uh, but uh, secondly, then, David, uh, is the I, I looked at recently as to the, the collections have a value, the, the products have a value. Uh, and if that's right, is the retailer liable if the products are stolen? And if so, are there insurance products available to cover that risk? If the containers, the, the payment of the deposit back to the retailer is based on the items that are collected and counted, and therefore, therefore there is an issue for security, if you've got a small store, you can't just leave this in the car park. 
Um, we, in terms of insurance, we're not an insurance provider. I have heard reports that some challenge around this additional risk being covered by insurance. Um, but to be clear, from, from where we are sitting, we need to collect the material to pay the reimbursement of the deposit. So security of returns on site, responsibility for that rests with the retailer. So the risk is on the retailer. Simon, I'll, I'll put this question to you and you can come back on the ad hoc cost. Uh, but you've obviously signed a deal with Biffa, uh, who will collect the products. What are the KPIs that CSL have put on Biffa to protect businesses from poor service, uh, if that would ha were to happen, uh, regularity of collections co happening on schedule, strikes or whatever. And given this committee's remit, what obligation on BIFA is there to be net zero? Okay, so come on your previous one. So uh, all collections are free. So uh, as part of the producer pays, um, the producer funds the scheme effectively. So there are no charges for any collections, be that for hospitality or retail. So if it's an ad hoc collection, that remains free of charge as per all other collections. In terms of uh, BIFA being net zero, so the technology and infrastructure right now isn't to where we would want it to be to run electric, electric and hydrogen. It's very expensive and it doesn't, it's not the best solution right now. So we have invested in vehicles so you have glass top loaders and you have m primarily panel vans for the small collections which are much more e efficient they will be euro 6 engines um, and we are working to ensure that when we come around to replacement of those vehicles we get to a position of are we ready for the infrastructure for electric and hydrogen can we change and upgrade what I would say in terms of uh, kind of getting to net zero the solution is predicated on where possible to use it as much existing mileage as possible. We're also using uh, retailers for backhaul. So any empty running that is taking place between kind of retail outlets and uh, main recycling hubs will be done primarily by retailers um, and the rest will be picked up by Biffa. But absolutely they are tasked with moving towards carbon neutral. Now, in terms of KPIs, we will be managing in-day. So the current collection frequency is based on in-day. Uh, they will be collected in-day based around somebody's operating hours and based around any collection restrictions because we're mindful that, it's, particularly in cities, you can't just put a bin on the street. So BIF will be managed on a daily, monthly uh, and weekly basis to ensure that they're meeting those KPIs and any concerns we have should be raised directly with Circularity Scotland and we will come back and challenge BIF in, in those meetings. Um, in terms of strike planning, it, I, should that ever be a concern, then we would work with BIFA to kind of get to that point. But certainly from a recruitment process and uh, BIFA are not a unionised environment and the DRS division that have been created are not a unionised environment. So we don't expect that to be an issue, but you never know. Um, in terms of kind of, uh, there is some bad press for BIFA in the past. DRS is a completely separate division has been created to deliver uh, the deposit return scheme. Grateful, thank you. Thanks, Liam. I'm now going to come to the Deputy Convener, Fiona. Uh, can I ask how the Scottish Government has kept you updated or informed in relation to whether an Internal Market Act exclusion uh, will be granted? Have you sought or received any guidance from the Scottish Government or sought independent legal advice regarding how to prepare for different scenarios. And bearing in mind there's been hundreds of millions of pounds of private company investment put into the scheme for a 16th of August go live. Uh, is there a risk of uh, legal action for compensation from any of those private companies of whoever may be concerned in refusing that act exclusion? Thank you. In terms of our knowledge of the Internal Markets Act issue, I guess our knowledge of the situation is no different to what's in the public domain. Obviously, when we are speaking to government, we are asking for an update on the situation, a view of what's likely to happen. Um, together with our partners, we're, we're seeking any information we can on where this may go. And as I say, I, I don't sit here today feeling that I know anything that isn't in the public domain on that. Um, in terms of our 
we, um, and when this issue came to light, the first thing I did was called our own lawyers to explain precisely what the situation is, as you would ima imagine. And therefore, my understanding is that the regulations remain, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but they're, they're, they're good and robust and legally enforceable in Scotland. There's a challenge if you try to enforce them with a business south of the border, and that's why the, the exemption is required. Um, when we are looking at how we expect it to play out, my belief is were that exemption not... And our, our legal advice was that the risk assessment of it not being in place was low, but I recognise it has become politicised, which for us we feel increases the level of risk. Um, we expect the big producers, if the scheme goes live on the 16th of August, that, that the, there may be some exceptions, but certainly the vast majority of producers we expect will operate the scheme because the regulations remain in force in Scotland. And it's the vast majority of those producers that we are speaking to recognise their responsibilities here and will, will act in a responsible way on the understanding that that exemption will be achieved at a point later. Obviously, in terms of detailed planning for that particular issue and whether producers who've made investments, retailers who've made investments, or our partner organisations who've made investments, would be coming back to recover funds. Um, that's probably a more difficult one. Clearly, there would be a, if, if the scheme did not happen as a result of that, there's an awful lot of investment out there that would be looking to get recovered. Okay, and then finally, um, you said that you want to know where there are deficiencies. The Scottish uh, Grocers Federation have been clear to us and, and in the last week have written to this committee and there are you know, ma many outstanding issues which you must know about because um, they'll have told you. Uh, why, why are they still um, having these concerns and, and can they be resolved by the 16th of August? Uh, retail handling fees have gone from cost neutral to um, actual costs incurred. Reimbursement was not no longer uh, seven days, but have moved for monthly in terms of cash flow. Collections um, may not be on, on a daily basis, and there's obviously concerns about investment there. The planning regulations for reverse vending machines are benefiting supermarkets, but uh, there are difficulties in more localised collection. And I think the concerns there in terms of the terms and conditions of signing up means that you know it's a bit of an open you know, a, a, an open checkbook that they're expected to sign when all these things are still outstanding. So why are they still writing to us to express their concerns that these issues are outstanding? And how do you intend to resolve them in time? And David, I, I just say to you that, please, can, a short answer, a fulsome answer, but a short one would be, would be appreciated. We're continuing to work through all the issues. We're aware... We, we, we have lists of issues coming from various organisations. With the stage that we're at in building this, of course there are still items to be, to be resolved. If we look at the return handling fee, I'm happy to discuss that in more detail, but we have an agreed method which our members set out, Scottish Grocers Federation, one of those members who signed our constitution, which we're instructed by in terms of the process which has to be taken to calculate a fee which aims to put the retailer in a cost-neutral position based on the costs that are to be recovered in the regulations. That's something which is being carried out through a very extensive process involving consultation with retailers. Around the payment terms point, the majority of return points will be, will be paid seven days after we count the returns. What we have done when we've issued the agreement, the, the document which sits in place between the retailer and the scheme administrator, is we have set out that for automatic return points, we are seeking payment 30 days after return. So the return is immediate um, trigger of that payment 30 days later. So it is not a difference between 7 and 30 days. It's collection counting plus 7 days to 30. The reason for this is because the vast majority of automatic return points will be operated by the biggest retailers. They have long payment terms with their suppliers and therefore will get a cash flow benefit as the scheme goes live. We recognise that a number of small retailers are investing in those machines. We have spoken, I'm speaking to one of the, I won't say which state, who I'm speaking to when, we are working our way through speaking to trade associations to make sure that we are able to address the concerns of the smaller retailers that may be impacted by this. 
One of the challenges we have is that we are trying to conduct effectively a commercial negotiation between some of the biggest companies in the world under public scrutiny. And therefore, we're having to work on issuing draft contracts and putting these terms out there to get in a position with these very large companies that is not exploiting those small producers who are feeding into this system. And we're having to find compromises through it. We've seen with small producers we can compromise. We will do the same where possible if there are issues with convenience retailers. And we will work through the issues that are on that list as best we can. Yeah, did you, uh, yeah. Oh, okay, so I'm just going to come now to the members who are not on the committee. I'm going to start with Morris, then go to Focus Ewing, and then go to Brian Whittle. Uh, Morris Golden. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener. Um, just to follow up some lines from Monica Lennon, Mr. Harris, I think you've mentioned twice that Circularity Scotland's in uh, a constant dialogue with government. So I'd just like to ask you just simple yes or no's around if topics have been discussed, and I won't ask you any further details around what was uh, discussed. So, um, as Mr Jones alluded to, BIF has bought almost 200 vehicles to transport the return containers. Uh, they're not net zero. Um, they're actually conventional petrol and diesel uh, vehicles pumping out emissions. Uh, so, simple question, has the Minister raised uh, this issue with Circularity Scotland? No. Thank you. And uh, clearly, we have seen reports around Biffa's environmental record. They were fined £1.5 million for illegally dumping waste abroad, with a judge describing their actions, and I quote, as reckless and bordering on the deliberate. Has the Minister raised any questions with Circularity Scotland around Biffa's environmental record? We have discussed Biffa at length. Whether, I don't recall whether that specific issue has been raised, but if you'll in, allow me, we selected BIFA through a very extensive tendering process. We looked at their ability to manage the collections and operating system in Scotland for Scotland's deposit return scheme. Also, their ability to provide the investment that we required as a shell company at the time to meet the obligations we had been given. At the end of that process, which included a vast range of companies, large and small, we reached the conclusion that in BIFA we had the right partner. We were aware of the issues which had arisen. To be clear, they will have no control over where materials are going. They are providing a, a logistical operation. I'm, 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 my intention was not to raise uh, further details about Biffa, but you've raised the, the tendering process. In terms of waste collections, is it not the case that the way the tendering process was run, only a, a, a large multinational business could feasibly win the bid? We looked at a range of operations. So the, the companies came forward across a broad range of sizes. We selected, and to be perfectly clear, when we got to the end of this, we selected Biffa because they had the resources to put the investment in place, particularly driven by the operating centres, the, the new facilities that need to be put in place. Within the contract, they are obliged to use existing movements as much as possible, i.e. to contract with local existing providers. Happy to talk in more detail at the work we are doing to make sure that takes place. But it's there's more to this than just appointing one contractor. It's a contractor to run the system, a system which must use as much as possible of what is already there. You as far as I can on that. I need to go to Fergus Ewing as far as other questions are concerned. So, Fergus. Uh, th thank you, Convener. One, one of the, the main concerns about DRS is of the public. Uh, the public will have to pay more, more than 20p extra for. Um, individual beverage items. Um, can, can Mr Harris, can you provide any assurance to the public who increasingly will be becoming concerned about that, especially those who are elderly and firm, who do not have access to a car and therefore will have to hulk um, heavy, bulky goods back to a shop which may be some distance away from their home? Um, can you give assurance about what level of price inflation there will be above the 20 per cent? Some industry figures say uh, above the 20p. Some industry figures tell me it would be 40p, others around 30p, some even more than 40p. But can you give any 
assurance Mr Harris about uh, what the average increase will be above the 20p. Thank you. The only thing we have any control over is the fee that we charge the producers. Whether the producer passes that to their customer or not is the producer's decision. And likewise, whether the retailer is applying a markup to that fee or not is entirely a decision for the retailer. Irene, do you want to come in? Absolutely. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm going to let Fergus come back in on that because somebody's got to pay it, I guess. Mm, well, indeed, and I'm just quoting from a Herald um, article interview with your good self, Mr Harris, in which you said, and I quote, if, if you're accurately quoted, if we take into account the fact there are costs for operating this system, you anticipate that the producers will seek to pass that on. It will find its way down the chain. So you've already admitted that there will be cost inflation above the 20p. What I'm saying is that members of the public, particularly the poorest, will increasingly, as we move towards this scheme coming into effect, if it does come into effect, be worried about the impact that this will have in the middle of the worst cost of living crisis in living memory. If we look at a, if we look at a cost that's applied across an entire market, and the comment in the Herald, what, the, the point, question I was asked and the point I would make, would I expect that overall producers will seek to recover that from their customer, be that a wholesaler or a retailer? Yes, I do. I can't, it is not my decision. I can't give any guarantees on that. But if you apply a cost increase universally across the market, common sense says that's what we're going to see. Appreciate it. Time is short. And I wanted to cover brief, three brief issues, uh, important issues. The British Glass Federation advised that uh, this scheme will result in a diminution, a reduction in the amount of glass recycling into new bottles and jars. And the reason for that is the, there is no remelt target, uh, but also that uh, crushing machines will be used by BIFA. They have uh, procured crushing machines, and that means the glass will be crushed into fragments so small that they cannot be recycled into bottles of glass. And that means that the carbon saving, which comes from recycling into bottles, which is 580 kilograms per tonne, will be reduced to around about 4.5 uh, kilograms per tonne, a reduction in carbon savings of over 99%. Um, now, given that glass recycling into bottles and jars was estimated by Zero Waste Scotland uh, uh, back in, in 2017 as being between 70 and 90 per cent. Uh, isn't there a serious concern that British Glass Federation, whose advice was taken by the UK government, who then exempted glass from their proposed DRS, isn't there a real concern, Mr Harris, that, uh, and you don't set the policy, I understand that, but you're operating it. So isn't there a real concern that this scheme will actually result in less recycling of glass, not more? Thank you. Firstly, as, as, as you kindly said, we did not set the policy to include glass. I'd like to ask Simon to talk about what we're actually doing in terms of managing glass and making sure that that recycling takes place. Simon, please. So, Biffa have not purchased crushing machines for glass. Um, the, we expect natural breakage. We have spoken to the people that may use uh, crushers have been hospitality, and we're engaging with hospitality to understand how we can adapt those crush machines, because it's primarily for space, to ensure that fragments are, less than, are greater than 10 mil, or no smaller than 10 mil. Um, we're working with reprocessors, so we're in the process of working with glass reprocessors within Scotland to understand what size they can realistically um, process back into colour. Um, and we're working to understand what they do with anything that doesn't make it into, um, back into colour. But we are talking um, uh, 90, I, I need to check and I'll, we'll write back to the committee, but we're talking about 98% um, is likely to be recycled with 2% going, potentially going into aggregate. Before you do that, just, it would be helpful to write to the committee to answer that specific question. I'll get the clerks to make sure that that's relayed to you as it was on the official record. Mr Ewing, you were always difficult to, to keep... keep on time when you were sitting at the far end of the table. I would urge you to do it short, one further question, otherwise you'll upset Mr. Rittle um, and he's sat right next to you. Well, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, one final question. Um, plainly, small companies throughout Scotland, whether they're producers, uh, whether they're retailers, whether they're in the waste management sector, uh, are now worried that 
their businesses will be seriously adversely affected. Some will have to close, some will and are already planning to issue redundancy notices and close depots. They've recently read, Mr Harris, that you have a reported salary of £300,000. And this, uh, as, as you know, is a matter of public concern, as you said at the beginning. So do, do you recognise that anger and concern? And can you just clarify for me, is £300,000 the total remuneration or is there pensions and other benefits above that? And is it correct that you're actually working part-time because you have substantial other commercial interests, very substantial other commercial interests, to which presumably you have to devote some time? So can you answer those questions and perhaps give an indication about how many hours per week you devote to the CEO job at a salary of £300,000 of Circularity Scotland? Thank you. Um, I can confirm that's my salary. I can confirm that I work full-time in the business. Um, I would say at the moment I'm working in the region of 80 hours a week on Circularity Scotland. I have had to... I was asked to do this job. Industry approached me and asked me to take the job on. The board set my pay, they made the offer and I accepted that, one, partly because I've had to recruit people to run my, my other one business which I have so that I can devote the time which is needed to this. I was asked by industry to do this, I gave my word I would do the job and deliver what they asked me to do. That's why I'm devoting so much time and allow, allowing people to take care of the other business which I own, Irene. And if I can just add um, that um, uh, on the back of the membership body that we have um, and the, the way that we're organised in terms of our corporate governance um, and this, 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 the level of um, uh, professionalism that those member bodies have, you can imagine that we have a similar um, level of governance within our own business and therefore the, the appointment, um, the remuneration process is all approved at board and through the remuneration committee and that is put to members for their approval as well um, and all of that is, is within a, you know, with a commercial lens as well. Yeah. This question, just so I can clarify, I didn't mishear something. You, you, I think you said 80 hours a week, roughly, that you're working. Did you answer Mr Ewing's questions about any other payments regarding pensions and such like? I, sorry, I may have misheard it. I, I, I receive a pension contribution in the, uh, at the same level as every other employee of the company. OK. Um, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, and uh, good to see you again, Mr Harris. Um, I was considering our, our uh, conversation we had uh, last week and considering the implications of, of what you had to say, and, and I'm looking at it from a practical sense. And since then, I've actually happened to meet up with um, a constituents of my elderly, elderly couple who um, get their groceries delivered uh, by the, the supermarket. Um, they already recycle. They have a glass bin, they have a plastic bin, they have a, a general waste bin, and they also have a garden waste bin. Um, and they are, they are collected by the council. Now, they will be unable to return um, the, 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 the items which will be, uh, will be subject, subject to a, a 20p charge and will no longer be collected by the council and that obviously they, they will be out of pocket and given that um, as you said yourself that uh, you will be ramping this up from the start there will be a significant number of people um, in that, that particular situation who are unable to do uh, to take part in the deposit return scheme isn't the reality in the practical terms of and i recognize your role in this in terms of an administrator, but isn't the actual practical practicalities of this scheme in that those in that kind of situation, as my colleague Mr. And Mr Ewing said, those probably in the poorest in society will be the ones that actually have to pay for this scheme as it ends up they are the last people in the, in the, in the line. The issue of how to deal with home deliveries has been one of the problems of implementing these regulations. Um, Donald, could you, could you talk about where we actually sit at the moment Certainly. in terms of this situation? So the legislation as passed by Parliament um, made it very clear that retailers who deliver remotely online have an obligation to go to consumers' houses and collect those empty containers. I think it's the first scheme that's attempted to do that at scale. There are one or two other schemes which do it on a part piece. So it's a new piece of challenging legislation, fairly and squarely sitting with retailers to do that. And that's been known and laid out for probably about two and a half, three years. Retailers have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to meet that obligation and have been unsuccessful. 
and that was one of the reasons why I think recently the Minister announced an intent to make some modification. I think they're going to delay that particular part of the implementation. They are still directly engaged with the retailers to figure out how some of that functionality, that capability, can be delivered. That entirely sits with retailers to, to deliver. It's an obligation that they are still working out how to, how to achieve. Uh, our obligation is to go to the depots where those retailers uh, deliver and, and collect the empty containers from there. And we're working as far as we can to support that design effort. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a design solution which uh, the retailers have yet to, to, to deliver. Is it, is, uh, Brian, I was going to let you one further question because everyone else had two. But if, if you're sufficient on that, that's... Uh, th th thank you, Camille. I, ju I just think that, you know, that what we're discussing here is the practicalities of the scheme. And what we're looking for here is, is the ability for people to get their deposits back and also to be able to uh, recycle product. And in that circumstance, neither of that is happening. OK, uh, thank you. And, and there are a huge lot more questions which I was hoping uh, to get answers on. Um, and, you know, one of the questions would be, you know, do you get, do you get a refund of your 20p or do you get a credit against your shopping? It may be that the refund is critical um, at certain stages to certain people rather than a refund against the shopping. But these are questions that are still to be answered. Um, and I think the committee will have to consider what further work they want to do on this, which we're going to do briefly in closed session after this meeting. Um, and I'd like to thank the panel, therefore, for the evidence that they've given uh, to this meeting. And I would ask them to uh, quick, quickly leave so we can get consider what's been said and we'll go into closed session. Thank you. Thank you for your evidence.